All right, we got a big episode of the bomb hole today presented by Pub Beer. Uh, first things first, I just got to let you guys know, uh, Eastone is temporarily out of the booth. He will be back soon, but we got Mikey LeBlanc filling in. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing phenomenal. It's a great day today. Thanks for it's having me. Yeah, we're happy to have you. And it's a great day today because we got Jason Robinson in the booth. J-Rob, how are you doing? Living the dream, man. Well, we are so happy that you're here. And for our listeners that don't know who you are, we wrote a little uh, little paragraph here about you. Uh, Jason Robinson is a one-of-a-kind human from Whitefish, Montana. He is responsible for some of the most impressive snowboarding the world has ever seen. Whether it's the streets or Big Mountain, Alaska, J-Rob can do it all. He came on the scene, filmed parts for Think Tank, progressed quickly into absinthe parts alongside some of the best riders on the planet, like Nico Meals and Gigi. Uh, he won Big Mountain Ride of the Year. He's got a podium at Baker Bank Slalom. Off the snowboard, he has a voracious thirst for living life to its fullest. The wide array of unbelievable life experiences, which we will get into. But before we do, what brings you to Utah? What are you doing out here, J-Rob? It's good to have you in uh, in the state. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the welcome out here. It's been that's been a good good trip so far. This is it's actually my third time out here this season. Um, but yeah, came out, been working with, uh, Bodie filming this segment. Um, so we've been sledding out there together and yeah, we're doing this movie with Mike Hatchet and, uh, Mike Hatchet's directing it and TGR is producing it. So it's been, it's been a good time. Just kind of jumped in the mix. Um, Kind of had me all lined up out here. I just kind of plugged in with the crew, and yeah, it's been good. We've been been having some good days out. Fun. We actually, I ran into you at Powder Mountain earlier this year. We got to take a couple laps, and uh, he was getting after it with the bomb hold. It was a company ride day, actually, and this guy was going uh, Big Mountain Berry on him, mm-hmm. getting on some spicy terrain. It was really fun. Yeah, when I mean, the place is named Powder Mountain, you know, it's just how you got to do it out there. What, what were you doing when I saw you earlier this year out here? So at that point, um, I came out, linked up with Sam Tour. Uh, we kind of hit the hit the snow kind of early this season. He came out in December with uh, with Jed, Jed the Shred, and uh, yeah, we filmed out there a little bit. And then I came out, linked up with him, and we just kind of hiked around Grizzly Gulch, building some little jumps, and just kind of getting some clips. Is that for Air Blaster? Well, yeah, it, you know, he's filming for Air Blaster. I'm riding for Air Blaster, so it was kind of, um, and I've known Sam forever and worked with him a bunch. Some cool, really heavy projects, obviously, manifest and everything. And then, um, yeah, so he's just been a long time homie. Was filming for Air Blaster. I was like, kind of made the decision to film a segment this year, and was like, let's just get out there together and see what we can come up with, and then. Yeah, so we did that trip out in Washington, met up with him here. And then that was all before any of this sort of thing with TGR came up. So, But it's all um, going to just kind of flow right in there. All the clips we got and stuff are all going to kind of work for this this project. So, yeah, it should come together pretty good. Amazing. I've seen a couple uh, clips maybe off of Shane's camera that were looking spicy at Brighton. How how you liking late season Brighton? I mean, a lot of people at this point kind of – you know, the oh, powder's gone, but it looks like you're still stacking. Yeah, it seemed like that was kind of, you know, people kind of checked out of the, I guess, the Brighton backcountry there. Yeah. I mean, it's not like, I guess after a season like this, everyone's <laughs> ridden so much deep powder out here, yeah. and they're kind of like ready for some spring. But, I mean, it's been super fun. There's still soft snow. Like, it was still kind of, for being like almost 50 degrees, there was kind of some powder in there. So a little hot pal, a little, little mix, but... Yeah, crazy cool terrain and such a huge snowpack. So, I mean, it's my first time seeing it, but like hearing Shane's stories, like, oh, that was like a normally a 30 foot cliff and it's just like literally a snow roll or something, you mm-hmm. know? So, um, it's pretty cool seeing it. And it's like, 
kind of all time condition or all time snowpack at least. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well, it's really cool, you know, riding with J Rob at Pow Mau, you know, riding with you is really fun because I know you took a bit of a hiatus, but for the listeners that are wondering uh if he's still got it, he is annihilating. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's really it's yeah. been fun to watch, dude. Yeah. Thanks, man. I Thanks. Missed a beat. It's been fun to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's run it back. Let's run it back to the beginning and and just kind of I'm curious about the early days. You know, there's not that many snowboarders from Montana. You got Crawford, you know, maybe Travis Parker Travis allegedly Parker in the zone. But like there's not I mean your bro. It, it's pretty your bro. Yeah, it's pretty pretty uh small uh company of riders that have gone pro and and uh I'm just curious, you know, come from Whitefish, you know, tell us about how growing up in snowboarding in in Montana. Well, man, I was kind of born into a pretty good situation with uh, both my folks ended up working at the ski hill. Kind of classic story there, kind of cliche, but yeah, grew up on the ski hill. Big Mountain it was called, now Whitefish Mountain Resort. And man, that's all you knew as a kid, but like looking back now after seeing more stuff, like such an amazing place to grow up and really like mold, really well-rounded, kind of all-terrain riders and yeah, so it's, it's it was a pretty insane place to to be be from. Seems like you were kind of like a child prodigy because all the things I'm hearing from everybody's like, dude, I heard it like 12 years old. You, I mean, I want to hear you to tell this story about like border crossing when you're at 12, age 12. Yeah, I guess I was kind of low key border cross child sensation. I, I don't know what you'd call it, but um, I think I was I don't know what where that really came from, but um, I guess was pretty fast from pretty young and developed like pretty good board control only after a few years somehow I don't really get it but I mean I skied for a while before but um yeah like there I remember the it was the first time I went up for this border cross up to Canada and I was 12 and the homie Jim Faze big shout out to Jim he was the rep for ignition snowboards and so he was kind of my first sponsor, like floated me boards, took me up on my first trip. And I remember the age group was 12 and under or 13 to 17 or 13 to 18. And uh, he's like, you know, 12 and under is just product. You might win win something. I'm already flowing you all the gear. Like the next category up, it's like 500 cash. You should probably try it and do that. And I was like, all right, man, why not? So. My first border cross, like first, I don't know if it was my first contest even, but yeah, we did that. And I remember made it all the way into the finals and I'm in like, I'm in second. I'm like pretty hyped. And granted, I'm like, these 17 year olds are like looking like pretty grown men and I'm 12 looking like a, like a a little shrimp out there, you know? (laughs) And, but yeah, so I'm like in second place and the homie goes down and I take the, take the W and uh, yeah, it was a $500 check, you know? It was kind of a trip. Um, but, yeah, it's pretty interesting, like, kind of from there. Because I did that whole thing for – then that was 12 to 17 was, like, did it at least – they do, like, almost 10 of those events a year, 5 to 10, and we do almost all of them. And I ended up winning almost all of them. So it was, like, pretty cool. Stacking up. So why did you choose to go freestyle dogger instead of just pursuing the world of Border X? <laughs> Well, so the thing there is, uh, you know, I couldn't do that 13 to 17 age group forever, right? And then I turned 18, you know, and was in that gate with, like, Hardingham and Jonas Gwynn, and he's just savage, savages, right? And I remember, like, my first drop-in, and I was I normally thought it's, it's faster to, like, pump the bumps, you know? Some guys like to air them. Who's to say each course is different, but... I pumped him, someone else aired him and just like landed on me and full blowout. And because before that, I was kind of always like the whole shot was kind of my, my, my game. Like I was the kind of the whole shot guy and I good start get in front and stay in front. But yeah, after that, it was like, you know, it's not worth it. And, and I was having so much fun just like riding too. And that's when I was getting more into watching all the movies and, and all that stuff and kind of, already had like the bag of tricks was kind of growing so it was like more like mm-hmm. let's do this and then i guess really the the most obvious transition was like 
pretty much got to go straight into filming from that with uh, with Leland McNamara um, and NC Productions. So it was like, looking back now, it's like crazy rare opportunity for a kid that young to kind of just like step into a crew. You know, they were all still learning, but had it like f- figured out, you know, way more than I did. So I was able to just kind of walk, get in with those guys and they kind of showed me the ropes of that side of it. Yeah. Yeah, you sent uh, over your, your first video part, and so did Leland. I don't know what year it was. Was it two thousand one or what? Two thousand one uh, um, or something. It like would that. have been two thousand three. Yeah, right around. So that's the thing. This is this was season twenty. This was twenty seasons after that. So it was twenty two thousand two, two thousand three season. Would have been my senior year, or was my senior year in high school. But instead of going to school in Montana, I um, bailed down to South Lake and was doing like correspondence school and just shredding every day down there and you're dropping eight grades in nc productions that part's kind of kid had some heat <laughs> kid had some heat right out of the gate he's hitting handrails he's doing back fives in the powder yeah actually i saw like what leland sent me that this morning watching it i was like damn it was like it was pretty nice for, for back then dude <laughs> yeah. i was like kind of shocked myself granted you know like my a lot of my trick tricks haven't come as far that far since then but you know it was pretty let cool me tell you see. something i've noticed when i watch that the front seven melon has been automatic for two decades, huh? <laughs> that thing's, that's his go to. I saw one from a couple days ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and there's, and you know, I think a lot of that, like when I was a kid, I used to have such a imagination and in, in my dreams. I would like all my snowboard, I would like do all my snowboard tricks in my dreams mm-hmm. and then just kind of like try them. And two, with the front side, like that's on front side and switch back side are easy. The other ways are hard. It's so all the little side, all the, little cornice drop hits at my home mountain all like heel side for a regular footer so it was like super comfortable going front seven but like back seven i didn't learn back seven until i was like in my 20s or something mm-hmm. like well into my 20s that's wild also sidebar uh you know we, we'll put the video on the screen because we have it so it'll be playing but for the people watching on youtube but I, the kits, man, you're running some. Uh, he, he was <laughs> running looking jerseys, a, looking <laughs> a little T nine. Yeah, he was looking like fresh out of like hard to turn, hard well, to earn. I mean, it looked tech like you know, if East Stone yeah. was sitting here, he would be proud. Yeah, yeah I think East Stone, he'd be proud. Um, yeah, I was watching. I was like, sky high resi, open jacket, <laughs> Louis Vuitton <laughs> basketball jersey. <laughs> like, what? Where? You know, where is this kid coming from? But yeah, and. Um, Bertner coined the G Rob as my my nickname through that that wow. sort of era, which mm-hmm. that's a good. Even we're running white pants in a shot. Yeah, you got to be feeling a, yourself. You have to, to be good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you got to be good when you wear white pants. Yeah, you got to be confident. That's confident. for sure. You got to have a lot sure. of confidence. Yeah, a lot of uh, incredible. Well, isn't there some stories too? Uh, Mike maybe mentioned that um, your first packages yeah. from Moro and stuff. right? Yeah, your mom was telling me about. Yep. Yeah, twelve years old. You know, she told me you're a big Italian family dinner every night, and she remembers the, f- the phone rings. Why don't you take it? Yeah, I remember that too. And we're sitting around the dinner table. Well, I guess let me go back a few from that. So my mom, after the um, ignition kind of thing, I got a few contests and stuff, and then they went out of business. I think is what it was. And so my mom was just like, "Hey, sent me out with her one of her friends who took photos. We got a few snaps. She put together a little like." Helped me put together a little resume, portfolio kind of thing. Had me pick like five sponsors, that five companies that I was hyped on, and she sent them all this portfolio along with like a dozen cookies or brownies or something just to like... Sweeten them up. Exactly. So Martin. like literally they got... I remember, yeah, they probably got this package, you know. Who's this little girl from Montana with a bunch of cookies and goodies in here? And like, <laughs> sure enough... We're sitting around a dinner table, and there's a call you know, on the landline phone. Chris Owen, Mara West Beach. Shout out. Shout yeah. out to Chris Owen, dude. Really put that, um, really kind of planted that seed in my head of that, that this was could be a reality, you know? So, and that was insane. So he's like, Yeah, let's line you up, um, send you some stuff to check out. And, you know, it shows up, the package shows up, it was like five or six decks, like a couple West Beach full kits. And I was just like, yeah, this is dream, dream life right here. Like a kid, I was so hyped, dude. I remember trying every one of those boards, just like changing the stances, figuring everything out. Just like it really just kind of like pushed, got the ball rolling there. And you know, crazy thing, because then we even went to 
you know, and shout out to my mom, obviously, like, incredible. Like, who would do, like, that's such a huge thing. And that same era, like, that same season, we went up to West Beach Classic in Whistler and, like, staying with, that's where I met Josh Dirksen, um, Crawford, I'd met him, but it was Crawford, Tyler Lepore, and then Chris Owen, and we were just, like, all in one of those Whistler condos, and my mom and, and me, and it was just, like, yo, I'm, like, kind of felt like part of the part of the gang, and it was, like, dude, I remember Dirksen especially kind of, like, took me under his wing, and or we were taking some laps, and that was a really cool, cool rapport, like, even at that young age, like, and, like, I've really kind of admired him since, you know? Mm-hmm. It's amazing how impactful you are at that age and how a an interaction with Dirksen like that can either positively or negatively infect you, like impact you so much just by little things. Just him being nice to you probably had such a big impact. That's killer. That was sick. One thing that you just mentioned earlier, I kind of wanted to rewind before I forget. So you were talking about dreams. In your dreams, yeah. you would do front seven melons. I love getting into the mind of like a snowboard like yourself. So like... Are you are you like a mind snowboarder? Like you spend a lot of your time daydreaming and, and thinking of tricks and like and just like visualizing snowboarding and sleep. Well, yeah, I mean, I remember even as a kid, like down, driving to the bus on as a kid, every ditch, you know, I was like, I'd have my finger out, kind of like shredding it, and then even like high school, early high school, still I think pretty little um, shy maybe socially awkward a little. And, like, I would even walk around all all through school, through the lockers, everything. Wherever I was going, I was, like, <laughs> shredding the, <laughs> yep. the the thing. is just, like, so weird looking back. Like, still, I do it a little, but, like, it was just, like, totally. Th- but, yeah, with, like, the dream thing, though, it was, like, and sometimes not even tricks. It was just, like, I would just j- pop at the top of the run and just, like, turn or, like, s- go to spin and just grab and just you would just who knows how many rotations. You would just, like, float fly away all the way down and I don't know I don't know how it how it related to like yeah but but there are some tricks that like literally like try it in the dream and then you're like oh you already know it you've already done it it's like the chemicals are essentially similar I think or the same it's like experiencing it so I think there's some some power there yeah, I love that. How about you? Do you do you visualize as well when you're trying to learn a trick? Yeah, I mean, at this point in my life, we're a little more focused on the podcast, so I don't spend as much time yeah. in, like like thinking of tricks like that as I used to. But uh, definitely, like thinking as you were talking about the finger boarding down the school, like I was just a person who didn't failed in school, but it's because I could just zone out and go to another place, and I could just like be mind snowboarding. Like I'd just be like thinking about tricks instead of like whatever the teacher was talking about. Mm-hmm. So I think I spent a lot of time mind snowboarding. Yeah. How about too. you, you yeah, Mike? Yeah, me too, for sure. Yeah. And I would also watch videos in slow motion. Cool. And do that. But then it's part, same thing, visualization and snowboard dreams. I know what you mean by flying forever. It's like sometimes the dream just fades out and you don't even like totally. it. Totally. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. But you yeah. can tr- you can feel it. You can almost yeah. like feel the oh, trick yeah. like before you've done it, like you said, and mm-hmm. that's. That's really special because, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I want to rewind too. Well, you were talking yeah. about your whole mountain being front side. You know, I've, I don't know if you've ever been over to where Giggy lives, but you can see from Giggy's home mountain okay. why he's so good at every kind of terrain because it has every kind of terrain front, backside, pillows, cliffs, jumps. Got it. And you as well, whitefish, you've got cliffs, you've got cornices, you've got cat tracks. Like you're saying, you didn't really have to build a lot of jumps. Yeah, so I guess. Yeah, because, well, the cat tracks themselves all went, they're all toe side. Mm-hmm. So I guess to jumping off the cat track always hooked yeah. left. Yeah. It was kind of like yeah. where that yeah that came from. That's killer. I That's like really how cool. you also like being raised by the mountain as yeah. a kid. You know, it's like the mountain's your babysitter. Mm-hmm. You see that with a lot of kids that are really good. Like, is that how it was when you were a kid too, when you were real young? Like, all right, Jason, we're going to leave you at the mountain. Like, come back for dinner or whatever. Yeah, like, I mean... Early it was like lessons, and then it would go like lessons the first half of the day, day or ski lessons, then to daycare. But then it was like literally the parents would just like set us loose, and even days where my mom didn't go up, we'd just take the bus up or whatever, and and just be up there. Um, but yeah, and then but no, like going back because the uh, the terrain of the of Big Mountain the Whitefish kind of like jump back a second again, but and I think too, and I. 
I like writing a lot more kind of, even when there is like a something to set up, it's always kind of, I'm looking at a little more natural and I, where writing with some, some people you kind of see is a little more set up like, like a straight feature. Mm -hmm. And I, I would put a lot of that like, um, influence from, from the mountain and the Mm -hmm. terrain of like, and not having a park to really just Mm -hmm. like play in all day. So we were like, still wanted like freestyle motivated, but didn't have the park. So you'd have to kind of get creative, which. Dude, the most prime example of this, I'm going to jump way out of chronological order because the most prime example of this, I think I was talking to him on the phone yesterday and, and you know, the clip of you backside rodeo sevening into birthday bowl in Alaska is one of the most incredible things ever done on a snowboard. Cause you, if you don't land, you're violently tomahawking. <laughs> Like it's two thousand like, feet. Two thousand feet. And so if <laughs> you if, if you watch when Bodie does it, Bodie builds a pat down. Shots fired. And it's he front seven. It's know, amazing. And that uh, was fire. Very, very incredible. Uh in his and then but then J Rob went and does the back rate of seven. And just walk us through your process because it was a little different. Well, yeah, obviously I saw the that part with Bodie and it just blew my mind. And then when we're actually there and you see it and you're like Oh, I, you know, it looks it looks a little more approachable in real life sometimes. Sometimes it's the other way around, you know. But um, for that particular thing, um, it, yeah, it kind of seemed a little more approachable. And I don't know how I got in my head. I wanted to back rodeo seven off it, but it, it just kind of lined up. And yeah, I remember someone they like kind of asked like, oh, "Are you gonna set it up or anything?" I'm like, "Dude, I think it's just I think you just go in from here." Because I don't I never like when you're riding in from cause how far are you gonna set it up all the way back. Like when you ride from that powder and transition into the packed part, mm-hmm. there's like a, you know, like a little lapse or like a little transition, I guess, into it. And then it could throw you off or whatever. But I don't know. And then just something about just riding into it, fresh snow the whole way. Um, but yeah, on that particular one, you know, I even on the way in, I was like, oh, maybe I bit off a little more than I could chew not packing this down because I went to go with the spin and my whole nose kind of like, dug in and it, but it just kind of the way it popped me around was kind of just lined perfect with the landing and everything and yeah it's an incredible shot every i mean i that shot when was that maybe like 10 years ago that was 20 yeah 2013 maybe? 14, 2013 yeah, 14, 14 yeah. dopamine someone just reposted it like a week ago and I'm, it just it's it's so iconic it's a it's a forever timeless shot mm-hmm. It's true. Thanks, huh? and no, that, I really think so. Totally. And the fact that he hit it natural yeah. to me, that was because I was like, dude, there's snow. Fl-. I was talking to him when, when I was driving. I was like, there was, I was watching the clip again and the snow was kind of flying on your tail. Did you pack that down? He's like, no, I just hit a natty, bro. I just hit a natty. <laughs> and I think that, like, that's just to me, like, I can't even imagine popping a back radio seven going that, like, slow and without, like, a hard surface to take off on. Yeah, and is it almost is it kind of a flat or almost down take? Probably like too? down. It kind of well, there, if, I, if I remember right, it kind of like rolls a little roll in, and then it just yeah, it's not. It wasn't like perfectly flat. There was yeah. a little downhill probably, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's still a decent edge. You yeah, know? but you really had to get creative. I mean, I, I've only done a back rodeo seven off a kicker, and you you kind of had to interpret that terrain. You hadn't ever dropped in on that. And just kind of yeah. just it's psychotic. Go. It's psychotic. <laughs> it's sick. I mean, it's very creative. But I think speaking back to having hit hitting everything natty at Whitefish, you had that built in for 15 years into your riding as a positive towards that. I think so. Yeah, we didn't really set much up. It yeah. was maybe ride into it once, get a track, and send it a little bigger the next time. But yeah. All right, we're gonna take a quick break and talk to you guys about Bub's Naturals. We're always talking about it here at the Bomb Hole because we hammer all of their products they recently came out with bub's brew it's their coffee bean the original br- blend it's usda organic it's fair trade and also it's the first ever coffee bean to be whole 30 approved another thing we're going to talk about today is bub's fountain of youth collagen i actually just discovered that they made flavored collagen didn't know that and uh, i've been hammering the fountain of youth collagen because it's tasty it's a nice berry flavor and we all want to relive our glory days out on the battlefield. And if you want to do that, you got to take care of your body. And collagen is huge for, you know, recovery. So you can go out there and pretend you're still 18 years old, even though you can't grab your snowboard. So we recommend Bubs Naturals. Uh, if you head on over to their website, bubsnaturals.com, use promo code BOMBHOLE. 
to get 20% off your order. Again, bubsnaturals.com, promo code BOMBHOLE. Get there. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about CB Days. It is a CBD company. I like to hit the OG muscle gel. Uh, what is this good for? Well, it's good for snowboarders, mainly because as a snowboarder, if you guys are like me, I get destroyed a lot of times when I go. Um, you know, a lot of inflammation, and a great solution to inflammation is CBD. So they got the tincture, they got the muscle rub, and I personally am a big fan of CBD products because they're a great alternative to, to opiates, and we see that as a major problem here um, you know, in society. So uh, CBD is natural, so it's a great solution to inflammation. Again, it's rider-owned, and if you want to support you know, snowboarders, then buy snowboarder-owned products. So head on over to cbdays.com, and you can use promo code BOMBHOLE30, and that will get you 30% off your order. And again, head on over to CBDays with a Z dot com. Use promo code BOMBHOLE30 for 30% off your order. Well, we happen Sick. to give, have a guest question from none other than Leland McNamara. Here we go. Sick. Guys, stoked you got J-Rob down there in the booth. Is yeah. Got a little two-part question for Jason here. So, Jason, over the years, your riding style changed a bit um, from you being mostly a jib kid in the early years to... Uh, being an insane big mountain rider. Um, I was wondering if that was the plan or if you had any plan. And then I remember one day riding with your brother Aaron and you at a place we called the House Lines in Lake Tahoe. And it was a pretty sick day. And uh, I think there was some good memories made there. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that day and if it was pivotal in any way for you to become the big mountain rider you are today. Um, yeah, stoked to check out the episode. And uh, yeah, have a good one, guys. Later. Yeah, man. Um, Leland, thanks, bro. Um, yeah, much love to Leland. Uh, homie since as long as I can remember, really. But um, yeah, that... Uh, the first part of the question, definitely no plan with that. You know, I mean, obviously, like I, I definitely admired the big mountain riding, the fast riding um, as a kid. Um, but yeah, I was definitely way more freestyle kind of focused. And like, that's kind of where the industry was too. And kind of wanting to get my way into it. That was kind of, kind of the road. And then, so it really wasn't a plan to be more backcountry or big mountain or anything. It was just and that comes that kind of ties into the other question too with that day with my brother i guess it's like yeah he he's really the influence i think that took my riding that direction and like and that direction is like as hard in that direction as i as i'd gone um yeah so that and then that day that day all kind of ties into it too cuz you know i'd never really ridden much lines and like my brother kind of took even though he's like my, my younger brother right and he kind of take he i was out trying to film parts with leland and doing this stuff he was just like free riding moved to washington riding alpental and baker and places like that and just like um har like harnessing those skills and that type of riding and then coming back and seeing him and where he progressed and then him taking me out to like ride my first like mini he was calling mini golf and like now it's like yeah mini golf i was like dude this is the biggest thing i've ever ridden down like and he's calling it mini golf he'd already been to like ak and stuff so it was like um kind of a cakewalk for him but he walked me through the whole thing you know with the photos and reading the lines and digging the pits and um yeah and then so like kind of hands-on teaching me that stuff and then full-on like watching him ride that stuff Cause yeah, and like that day in particular, the house lines, like, dude, I just was surviving, just getting down that thing. Even he was just playing with it. Like he came right off the top of the house, just for the fattest pillow stack. And like, I was just kind of like, well, like kind of made it down, you know? But, um, so yeah, that was, that was a big, big moment for sure. Get to see that and share that with him. Thanks Leland for that. That's cool. That's special. So your little bro kind of introduced you into bigger mountain stuff that's so fucking sure. sick 
filming for NC Productions, it was kind of a smaller, more regional crew. I'm curious of how you went from filming for NC Productions, because the first time I saw you was in Think Think. Okay. So. Well, yeah, and I guess, yeah, like you said, it's kind of NC was more regional. Um, a lot of the Montana homies, like Leland, went down to Bend and like teamed up with Sam Hiltner. Shout out to Sam. And uh, and then there was like the whole kind of bend, bend is obviously such a shred scene. And so there was like tons of talent down there and they already kind of had a crew um, kind of built. And yeah, like as far as how that went from that to Think Think, it was kind of, I'd met Bertner, it was a team challenge in North Star one time and we were all on Mervin. So it was kind of like, it was. Uh, I remember... It was Bradshaw, Bertner, myself, I forget who else, but um, yeah, it was kind of a dynamic crew there. But um, but yeah, so that that kind of, and I'd always kind of like was hyped on the Think Tank movies, and I knew in Tahoe where I was living, it was like Nick Viscani was filming for him, Tim Eddy, so there was like already some presence in the area. And then, um, yeah, we filmed, I just filmed with Leland one season, and like pretty good season, you know, it was just like us going out kind of solo. Sam tour would come with us sometimes too. And then, um, we just kind of put that out online, but I sent all the footage over to Bertner and he picked a handful of clips. That was in cool story in the, um, kind of friends section sort of ca um, cameo in there. And then I think the shots kind of stood out cause it was, it was like more, it was like bigger stuff. Like it was hit, hitting, uh, what do they call it? This whole stock rock, I forget what they called it now back in the day, right at, at ASI, though. Um, like big switchback five on that and another front seven melon, of course, you know, <laughs> but uh, some of the classic trusty moves. But, um, but yeah, that kind of got me in the door with Think Tank a little more. And then next season, it was like full on with Bertner there and the crew. And then, so how many years did you film with Think Tank before you went? Because was it, was it Think Tank right to Absinthe? Is that the chronological order? Or did you go to train? Or did you go no. to people? Or yeah, there was that that season with Pierre and people. We should talk about that. That was in that video part. It's all it's travel based. I used to watch it on my iPad all the time. What's the name of that video? Wise, pretty wise, pretty wise, pretty wise, dude. If you had a full part in that, it would have been fucked because it was montage based. Yeah, you yeah. Went to Quebec and yeah. you're doing jibs. You did the tail press jam off the knobber back one. Yeah, on the That's artillery. Some of my best, my favorite urban shots I ever got. Yeah. I think were that season. And you're hitting cheese wedges. Yeah, and we had a good uh, run in Whistler, Elias too. too. Yeah, right. with Elias and yep. Marco Smola. Yeah, that was a cool um, cool season. So, so Yeah. So then you go, so you're riding, so you're riding for Dekine, Lib Tech, and you're doing, so you did People, or I guess, yeah, so you did Think Think, People, and then Absinthe. Is that where you went from there? Yeah, so I just did that two seasons with um, Think Think. We did um, Right Brain, Left Brain, Ransack Rebellion, and I did the Pretty Wise, and then it was the next season... Um, was straight into that was absinthe dopamine, which that didn't come about till much later in the season, actually. Yeah, so on that next season after Pretty Wise, uh, Pierre was he was trying to do a movie, so but it just I don't it was kind of the sign of the times, harder to get budget, and he ended up not doing the movie. So I kind of didn't have a plan or a crew, and even I remember even at that point, Catch It hit me up and was like. He was trying to make a movie, but then it he didn't. It, that was like the year before would have been his last movie too. So those both kind of fell through, and then yeah, honestly, I, I did feel like a little like kind of like man, where do I do? Where do I go? Like had all this this energy and stoke to film, but um, but yeah, so I wrote a ton that season, um, not filming at all, and then I did do a trip with. Um, Lucas Dabari and his crew for that Go movie, Go Borden. And um, then from there, that's kind of when I ended up bailing from those guys and went up to meet Hosnick and the crew. And that was kind of like the rest was kind of history there. That was like ended up being probably March 5th or 6th when I. Yeah, I was talking to Justin. He said it was middle, early March. And it was interesting because it was the first time he met you. And he asked you, like, within a minute of meeting you, like, what have you been doing? And you're like, I've been riding bell to bell. Like, I haven't filmed anything all year, but I've been riding from the beginning of the day till the end of the day, which really struck him. Yeah. Describe cool. that. Lean in, like, explain that. 
yeah, so so yeah, I guess too. Um, part of that was like, well, we didn't have a, like the season before early. We were like on the gym trips, you know, like pretty pretty focused on that, and it was like nothing going, like n- no film opportunity. I was just like riding, and that was still what that was pretty recent after Aaron had passed away. Um, just the year and a half or whatever later, um, so I was still real like in a pretty rough place with that, and I think. That's probably that's like the the reason I was riding so much. It was like kind of this escape of like I just would ride as hard as I could every day and just kind of like not think about anything else. And so obviously when I'm riding, it's fun. And then it's also a way to like connect with him and then the people you run into too. It's like also kind of like reminders. And then these places like just riding our home mountain. Like I grew up with him there, and like mm. so all these kind of shared experiences. But like. I really didn't even ride with that many people because everyone wants to go inside and take a break or whatever. And I was just like going, you know, and then um, just like kind of like a freak. It was pretty crazy. And then that that really is kind of wild to think that's what led to me getting to film with Absinthe because through that, and that's what I've always said with the Baker Banks song, it's kind of like who's put in the most reps, right? Who's mm-hmm. got the most time on board, on edge, on rail, mm-hmm. um, that's who does well in that event. And when you're like filming all season, you know, you're not really riding like that. So a lot of like the, the really f- talented film riders aren't necessarily the ones winning it, you know, or placing. But um, on that particular season, yeah, it was like that event they normally do beginning mid February or whatever. And I remember I had 80 days on snow between like starting in. November split boarding and then the mountain and then like um so yeah I was like pretty tuned in with the board and like crazy shape and I remember I got third in that race and I came like I didn't even like the the run was it felt I wasn't normal like sometimes you get to the bottom of that run you're just so smoked and so exhausted and on that one it just like didn't even feel that hard or anything it was just so natural at that point um yeah so that's that was and so like you were racing border crossers too, right? Yeah, and there's the crazy. I guess that's the crazy part with that season because where that that third really stood out because it was first was yeah Seth Westcott, uh, gold medalist, border cross second, Grand Watanabe, silver medalist, and then I was in third, and then it was like fourth and fifth were both also border cross Olympians, and then sixth was like Terrier. Yeah, so it was just like this crazy. I kind of like. I prevented the border crosser sweep. But you're so but did you like, tell him that you're secretly a border crosser? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so that makes sense, right? Um but yeah, like I never did any of the pro border cross contests really, but yeah. So yeah, I guess I, my border crosser shined through that. It that really day. makes a difference. So like you were riding, not filming, like you said, eighty days on rail. Yeah. And you showed up and and that's a strong – I mean, that feels like a really strong year. I think every year at Baker's strong, but that year sounds particularly strong. These guys are coming off the Olympics and training For sure. super hard. Because – and then that – that and that's what – essentially talking with Justin, he said, well, that was like what led me to call you was mm-hmm. this result wow. in this event. Um, and I was like, okay. Yeah. So it all kind of – and then at that point, I was like, yeah, I'd been riding so much, and by the time I – got out with those guys it was just like stepped right in pretty seamless Mm -hmm. and this is dopamine right yeah dopamine dopamine. here and justin i know you had ender but he he thinks that's not not i had opener 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 in that one yeah Yeah. i know you had victor de la rue had ender in that movie but you had an ender eventually i had ender two seasons after that and ever since well what he was saying is he thought that your dopamine part was his favorite yeah, maybe it's because he was, you know, it was your intro as well. But he loves that part. Yeah, he, t- wow, he, that's cool. Thanks, Justin. But he told me that as at the premiere that my part was his favorite mm. to edit, mm-hmm. and two, I think part of that, like we spent that two months, like together. The, the other writers were kind of coming in and going, mostly like it was Blair Manuel a lot, mm-hmm. but we were also getting out with some other other guys too. But it was, um, yeah, him and I were like the the constant. Mm-hmm. We should we got to talk about some particular clips in dopamine yeah. that's jump out. Um, obviously, uh, you know, let's just start with the ender because you do you ride a line. 
uh, what's it called? Japan Spines? No, that's not. No, that's at uh, Eagle Pass and Rebbe. And and you ride back into your slough. Yeah, and you disappeared. Yeah, you that's know? a that's a good story actually. Because <laughs> yeah. um, so I was with the first day I was I was with Manuel in that same zone, and he rode these like crazy steep spines to like lookers right, and I rode that line, like he rode it first. I rode that line, and just rode to him, and then he starts like hey hey like freaking out and we look over and there's just this huge waterfall coming off of this cliff and then it's like that was that's incredible and then flash forward like a couple weeks we're still in the same zone and one day we're like kind of flying around looking for something to hit and i was like dude what if we just go to that same thing and i turn in and i just go under it and the waterfall like barrels me wow and so we because we'd already seen this whole scene play out you know it snowed another couple feet it was all refreshed and then just did it that way and like couldn't have turned out any better because it was like <laughs> so blind in there for i don't even know how long and then i remember even afterwards there's like this huge ice chunk at one point where i just wrote apparently rode pretty close by it like in a s- snow like snow cloud but <laughs> you, you look like a psychopath you're just <laughs> no, the, diving the, in the clip's insane yeah it's was pretty chill. Like the line wasn't that technical. The thing wasn't that. It was wild. Like turning in, and you're like, I would imagine what big wave surfing would could feel like if you knew how to do it. But I don't. But like <laughs> I'm going in, and it's just you see this whole thing happening, and I remember that last moment of like, well, here we go. You know, into the white room. Choosing the white room. Yeah. On purpose. Yeah. Is there any training you can do for that? I mean, I know. Like, I'm not trying to learn how to make a nice powder turn <laughs> at 50 years old. But, you know, uh, is, what's the training for going into the a, a whiteout? Is there any? Or I is don't it know. just experience? I don't know. I know, like, just riding my whole mountain, there, there was such so many tight trees, too. Mm-hmm. And so you'd see your line, like, you're going to go through this little hallway of trees to this one, like, all your little gaps. And then, like, you're c- controlling your speed from going too fast in these tight trees. Every once in a while, you're going to white room yourself. Mm-hmm. And you can't see that window anymore. Mm-hmm. So you have to remember like a split second ago what it looked like yep. now that you're already going, where those trees were. So I think it trains your brain. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, this was a little different scenario. Yeah. But, but when, uh, in general, though, what he's talking about, too, I noticed when you watch all your video parts, like you're in a, over all your parts, you're riding a lot of big lines and there's a lot of snow moving. And there's a lot of slough. Mm-hmm. And you seem so comfortable with sn- like large slough slides around you. How, like how do you get that way well i that goes to 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 the roots because even i remember riding some of the steeper tree runs at home as a kid and the first no one ever told me what slough was or anything and you like learned literally there's snow moving right there that pretty obvious how it happened but it's like whoa so i think pretty early like young like kind of thinking thinking on those lines and then i've always like been drawn to the shots where the slough kind of comes into play and people either play with it or manipulate it and Mm -hmm. And really that's something like kind of watching Aaron too. Aaron kind of had that flow and that understanding. And so kind of integrating that a little and then just the experience getting out there and trying it. And, you know, it's like the slough can be your friend or it can be your enemy depending where you're at and what your plan was and mm-hmm. how you executed it. But Now, now you know, you breezed over uh, kind of quickly losing your brother and – kind of uh, riding bell to bell, but I kind of wanted to go back and just maybe just ask how that affected you, like, um, on, a, on a deeper level. L- losing my brother? Yeah. How it affected me? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, there's obviously all these different stages in, in the grieving and everything, but, like, I mean, I think the the kind of end sort of, takeaway was just gratitude and I mean that's where I've come to peace in a way with it is just knowing um I mean to have it's so rare to even have someone that much light that bright a person in your life let alone your sibling and even your younger sibling and still able to learn so much um, on and off snow. And, and um, so that's really the kind of takeaway in so many ways is like, 
it could have never even had a brother like that or had that time. So that's kind of how you find peace, I think, with with the loss is like short time's better than no time. You know what I'm saying? And like so you you gotta you gotta find find that appreciation for it. Mm-hmm. Now I I couldn't help but ask myself when I'm watching these clips of you and you know like dopamine you do that natty back seven that's just ginormous into like the shoot there or just these wild clips that you filmed and and I couldn't help but ask myself when I was watching these clips is are you saying at the top like I'm doing this for for you are you using your you know your brother for some some power or are you tapping into that at all yeah that's a good question I think like those first couple years especially like especially that first year after filming that people part. And I was joking with Bodie actually, cause he was like, dude, your style was just so on point that season. And I remember like so many spots. I was like literally asking Aaron mm-hmm. for his help, you know, mm-hmm. through this or with this. And so I feel like that might've been part of how that, that his that style kind of showing through. I don't know, but, but yeah, like especially that year was crazy. Like how much I was talking to him on these spots. Like it's crazy. And then, too, and dopamine, because it was like, dude, such a whirlwind. And it was, I he'd been to AK like four seasons already at that point. And that was my first. And it was just, it was so crazy because I pictured always going with him, like my first trip to AK. And so, yeah, he he was like with me for sure. Um, but not not the way I'd imagined, of course. But uh but yeah, I definitely called on him a lot, and I still do. Like especially when it gets a little, a little hectic. I try to get be less greedy with it, and just like more like to keep you safe. You know, it's not like yo, let's get this clip. Like you try not to use your use all your wishes too too soon. But but yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah it's a good. It's been good. He's I think he's helped me out. I got I got a I got a couple guardian guardian angels mm-hmm. out there actually. So yeah. And- and around that same time, didn't you also lose one of your really close friends, too? Yeah, it was a few years later, at least, um, or quite a few years later. This was now four years, three or four years ago. Yeah, like pretty much my best friend all childhood, Dylan Candelaria, D'Lo, shout out to D'Lo. Like, he's like the eternal pirate, man. Um, but yeah, he he was he was a huge influence, like, we got traveled a ton as as kids, like teens, like sixteen to like twenty one. We're like doing a lot of the contests together and filming and stuff. And and then he kind of had a rough go with with the alcohol and kind of lost the snowboard sponsors and stuff. But then really like watching him with his life was like really getting in a really healthy place and things were going really well. And yeah, it was it's kind of a freak accident and it's still kind of unclear exactly what happened um but it was like a head injury s- scenario and they found him with his skateboard and his puppy like and yeah he passed away and that was that's a heavy one like and i was on a whole nother story but i was on a fishing boat in alaska when i like was texting with him and then we went out of service for a few days and come back to a text s- telling me that he was dead you know so it's like and I remember I was so excited because he's always been kind of a boat guy, and I never was, you know, never a boat guy. And here I am working on – and he's a fish, fishy gun guy, and I've never been a fisherman either. And here I am, like, on this boat fishing, and I was like – it's a whole crazy story how, how it works, but I'm driving this, like, 20-foot aluminum boat with, like, a semi-truck diesel in it, pulling this net around, and you put – it's a – feel like a bay the size of a couple of football fields and you throw like 40 boats in there and it's, it's called a shootout and they're all just like gunning for the fish, you know, bumpers and all this stuff. I was like so hyped to tell him this story because it was like so up his alley and so out of my, such a foreign, bizarre thing for me, but like I still like excelled at it. And yeah, and I came back and it was like planning the way to get off the boat to go to his like ceremony heavy that was a heavy one yeah is he one of your guardian angels as well yeah for sure point? for sure yeah now i was thinking about this too because you've obviously had a lot of grief in your life and i'm sure there's people listening that have 
are dealing with grief in their own life and as somebody that's navigated some some pretty tough scenarios uh any advice or for for helping navigate those hard situations of losing loved ones you know it's a tough tough thing to give advice on i think but if any small thing that would help i think is just not to you know kind of turn your back on yourself and like going into your passions as much as you can as hard as it could be in that those times um i think is kind of the the way cuz cuz you kind of need a distraction almost and a lot of people turn to drugs and alcohol it's a pretty easy easy way to do it quicker way to do it but yeah i i'd have to say like that's pretty temporary and you're going to have to you know face it all anyway but um but yeah i think staying immersed in your passions and and you know doing it for that person if you have to you know if that's like how you have to rationalize it cuz you know whoever in your life uh passes away is like they don't want they want you to live a full life and not you know just be depressed about it like straight up you know so mm. that's kind of yeah, great. Yeah, that's great really stuff. Advice. Short and dirty. But. What would they? What would they want? They want you to do great. They want you to. They want you to back rodeo seven in the birthday bowl is what they want. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? And they they wouldn't want you to pat it down either. They'd want you to ride. Down. <laughs> mm-hmm. Go. Well, for you it. got those guardian angels. You know, you're a little more like, eh, what? Well, it'll work out. Have you ever talked to a medium or anything to connect? No, I haven't. And actually, Travis has recommended I try that um, one time actually, but. I never have, and a couple I know, like a couple, like Aaron's his like girlfriend, who was his girlfriend, um, she kind of talked to one of my parent, my mom I think did, I think they gained some, you know, there's some healing there for sure. Yeah, I've I've uh, done it talk for a f- close friend of mine I lost, and yeah, it's it's, it's good. It it's uh, I know this is you know not for everybody. Not everybody's gonna buy into that or this or. I mean, have different beliefs around things like this, which is totally okay, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, for me, it brought a ton of peace and comfort, and and the reminder was like, you know, talking to him was, he kind of just told me, "Hey, I'm with you all the time, buddy." Like he was like, and you're like, oh, cool. you know, and didn't his personality didn't change anything. So, anyway, it's brought yeah. a lot of peace and comfort, but interesting stuff. That's to good talk to hear. About. Yeah, totally. Uh, we have a guest question from Justin Hosnick. Let's give him an air horn first, too. Yo, Justin. Okay, here we go. Hey, guys. Justin Hostinek here. Christopher, Michael, Ethan. Love what you guys are doing with the bomb hole. J-Rob, great to see it's your turn. And, um, yeah, one of the things that really stands out to me is how consistently you always wore your helmet when you were snowboarding even way before it was cool. (laughs) I think it would be really interesting to hear about how that came about. And um, I'm really looking forward to your episode. Love you, brother. See you in the mountains. Hey, Justin. Thanks, buddy. Love you, too. That was uh, good to hear your voice as well. And, yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, Definitely pretty, um, pretty important, I think. To talk about but um yeah so really because yeah i never wore a helmet before aaron passed away and then you know from a head trauma um he wasn't wearing a helmet would it have been different if had he been i don't know am i to say it? was it was he ready and this was his time to go whether he had one or not and and wanted to go to the you know the next the next chapter I don't know, but um, so I didn't want to just use that as, oh, I should wear a helmet now. Um, so really, I just asked my mom. Simple as that. She'd lost one son to a head injury. I was still pers- decided I was still going to pursue snowboarding, um, not s- slow down at all. If anything, just foot on the gas. And um, I just asked her if she'd want me to wear a helmet. And of course, like, I'm sure 99.9% of mothers, or if not 100, <laughs> she said yes. So it was like, yeah, it just kind of, boom, there, I slapped a helmet on. And honestly, 
you know, the, the first year kind of felt a little weird. I even forgot it like to a session or two, but like now it just feels so weird without it. And I was like so used to it. And, and I don't know, like I see it in the clips, whatever my head, I got a huge head, like whatever, <laughs> like, you know, like I, it's not that bad. Yeah. I'm excited to see, I mean, looking at Natty select and seeing, you know, Travis and a lot of people wearing them too. Yeah. I mean, the terrain you're in, the, what you guys are doing. I mean, I, this season was the first season I've ever been on top of a line and been like, I've never thought this. I was like, I should, I wish I had a helmet right now. Yeah. So also well, just. That's a good point. And it's, you know, if you're going, it's one thing if you're going 15 or 20 or if you're going 55 or 60, it's like kind of riding you're doing what, if you're a pro, what kind of message are you mm -hmm. putting out there? Because I know a lot of people in like the north, like outside of the industry, they all wear helmets, and then they see the pros, and they're like, "Dude, I would never even look at hitting that thing." Mm -hmm. And I wear a helmet down everything, and you guys are doing these crazy stuff without it. But like, I'm not the preachy wear a helmet guy yeah. either, and I would never want to be that. I think. You know, that the equipment has come a long ways and there's cool, comfortable helmets. And sure, you're not going to look as cool. Like, your hair's not going to flow in the wind, whatever. But, you know, that's a great it is take. what it is. That's a great take. I think yeah. that's a really solid take. It's a yeah. good point, too, you said about, like, you know, uh, when you look around a lift line. Like, we were in Colorado for Dew Tour and I was looking around the lift line. And I want to say, like, 90-plus percent of the people were wearing helmets. Mm-hmm. I was like, damn, snowboarding's come a long way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the past, like, that almost feels like the past five years. It's like, yeah, it used to be like a lot, most of the skiers did, but not mm -hmm. a lot of snowboarders. And now most recreational snowboarders are wearing them. Dude, and even like a ton of pros are wearing them, which is, mm -hmm. I mean, it's 10 times more than used to, or mm -hmm. 100. I don't know. There's so many more than we're riding them 10 years ago. Yeah, I think it may, a lot of the parents have got their kids started out now and they just, you just get used you to it. You grow up with it and with it. why take it off now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a quick break and talk about one of our sponsors. Their motto is trust the bum, Mikey. Do you know what that is? No. What are you talking about? It's called Sun Bum, Mikey, okay. and they make sunscreen. Their logo is a, it's a monkey, and wow. you might have seen it on a couple pro snowboarders' oh, yeah. boards. I, I think I've seen it on Blake Paul, maybe Parker's, and Jill Perkins. Yeah, 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 you might have seen it on Brian Fox as well. They, okay. They're a sunscreen company. They support snowboarding wow. and snowboarders. They support the podcast. Well, one of the problems is that I only use like a 50 SPF. The 30 doesn't cut it. Well, let me tell you something, Mike. You are in luck because they make a mineral SPF 50 face stick. It's like a little glue stick. Wow. You can just keep it in your pocket. So it's not a huge bottle floating around when I'm riding? It's no. Just a, okay. Yeah, you just keep it right in your pocket. You know what else they make? What? They make lip balm. You okay. know what that's good for? What's that good for? Keeping your lips from getting sunburnt and dry here, especially in Utah where it's dry. Mm -hmm. Do they use lotion? Do they make lotion? Yeah. Okay, yep. good, because my hands are always chapped out here, too. They make lotion. They make sunscreen. They make lip balm. They make it all. So if you're going to support, uh, you're going to get some sunscreen support, Sunbum. Buy it at your local surf shop, snowboard shop, and support the companies that support snowboarding. So I want to rewind to something you mentioned earlier. You were yep. We were talking about your brother and maybe some of your other guardian angels and you said you didn't want to be too greedy, ask for too much. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I didn't really, hadn't really put it that into words yet until like, until here it kind of like made sense. Um, but yeah, I think really what that kind of comes down to, I feel like, you know, especially when Aaron first passed, I was kind of calling on him for, for a lot, mm -hmm. you know, but maybe I, I needed a lot at that time, mm -hmm. you know, it was, really vulnerable and in a, in a really uh, difficult place. And, uh, you know, those were all answered one way or another, right? So, uh, yeah, I think you don't want to push it, push the limits there. And, like, now thing, when things are kind of going a little better, and like, like I was saying, like, I'm not as much like, oh, help me get this trick, you know? Mm -hmm. It's more like asking for safety and a little protection. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of keeping it at that, you know? Yeah. Mm. Natural growth. That's good towards stuff. Towards back into yourself a bit more, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then uh, what I hear, too, is is there's kind of asking for things for what you want. And I hear a lot more, like, being thankful for what you have, too. Kind of like, I, it sounds like your gratitude's been a big practice as well. I guess I think, yeah, probably the more grateful you are, the less you're going to ask for things, because... 
everything kind of is provided one way or another, it kind of se- seems. Mm-hmm. Well, let's keep this going because I love this timeline of uh, you just filmed for Absinthe. You started in March and filmed an unbelievable part in Dopamine. And then what followed up that summer? What, what did you get into after that? All right. Um, so that summer, that was an interesting, interesting summer, if you can say the least. Um, but yeah, it came off a pretty crazy dopamine dopamine hit, you know, literal and figuratively. And it was a pretty crazy kind of transition in my life um, where like snowboard wise, everything was like kind of going parabolic and in a way and all these sort of dreams and goals all come into fruition. And then on like a personal level with all the grief with my brother and the relationship I was in at the time was kind of falling apart and, and everything was like, my family was in really kind of dire straits with, with the grief and everything. And, um, so I guess during that summer coming home, um, the partner of the time we had split and I was, uh, kind of looking for something more, something interesting to do this summer. I, I remember I actually just wanted to get out of town. I had a ticket to Nicaragua and for like a month or something, I was just going to go learn to surf. You know, that seemed like a good way to kind of come down from this, this, uh, high. And, um, I remember I got the ticket and everything. And that night before I wake up the next morning, couldn't find my passport. So I like going to get on my 6 a.m. flight, no passport. I had it in my pocket the night before, kind of went out on the town. It was kind of a um, weird night, woke up, no passport. And so I had to cancel that trip. And I was like, well, no, what do I do now? Like I kind of had my next plan kind of covered. Now I got to at least order a passport before I can even do it again, you know? So Went to Craigslist where, you know, you can find things and um, found this place to rent on the Blackfeet Reservation outside of Browning, Montana, on the east side of Glacier Park. And I saw the, saw the photos. And it looked amazing. I called the landlord. We totally hit it off over the phone. And he's like, it's yours. Come check it out. And went and checked it out and it was just incredible like 10 acres this little cabin on the meadow there's like moose running around the little marsh over here and grizzly bears running around it was like you're like right at the foot of the glacier park and the rocky mountains so like to your west it's just these huge peaks jutting up and to your to the east is just flat plains you know as far as you can see so like that sun crest is like 5 a.m you know there's nothing blocking the sun that direction um super unique i'd never really spent more than a few days at a couple days at a time out in that area and so there i was living solo and was kind of getting into a pretty good groove out there actually it was pretty fun um i started getting into kayaking that summer but like i remember after the first couple weeks i was like you know i i kind of got to make something happen because like that was the kind of catch with the dopamine getting invited with Justin to film was the the buy-in you know the money for, to buy it to get explain your this to people that don't understand so I guess the buy-in for a, for a movie film is like essentially the spawn typically sponsors that want to promote their writers will pay the production to help fund the movie and that essentially I mean it doesn't guarantee a space obviously the the writer has to film the part and do the things but it's kind of giving them the opportunity to film with the crew and get the all the time and energy of the filmers and the whole production of it. Um, so, yeah, so I had, you know, owned a, owed a bit of a chunk from that because when he called and invited me to film, it was kind of late in the season, and as I called all my sponsors and there wasn't really a budget for it. So, yeah, to backtrack a little, on, it was like never met Justin before. We spoke over the phone. He extended this opportunity to film and essentially a credit, $20,000 credit, um, so that I would essentially pay back. And then, so that summer I was out there kind of 
in kind of a dream world out on the on the reservation. Um, not gonna lie, it's all like pretty dreamy. Like the whole experience is kind of like this sort of whimsical dream fantasy kind of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so I was like, you know, I, oh, these guys all I lost all this money. You know, I, I worked in or lived in Northern California for a handful of years. Kind of developed a bit of a green thumb out there. And, you know, all medical and everything there in in California. So it was all kind of above the above the books, above the above line, above ground. And uh, so I kind of was like, oh, these guys this much money. How else would I get it back? And I went through all the stuff to get my medical lined up in Montana. But, like, there wasn't really time to wait around for it. So I built the greenhouse, kind of planted some, got some plants going, had a nice little garden, cannabis garden, and um, yeah, long story short there, I guess it didn't last that long. Um, obviously, the the crop never came to fruition. It uh, was seized by the Glacier County Sheriff, and I was essentially issued a warrant for my arrest for production of dangerous drugs and Montana is a mandatory state minimum it's a felony charge with a mandatory state minimum two years in state prison and that was kind of the you know this thing that I figured was relatively harmless you know aside from like kids that could potentially get their hands on it like I don't I'm kind of pro cannabis I guess um you know, responsibly and of age. But um, so, yeah, this pretty small crime, of how I thought of it, all this, which had it been like a week or so later, would have all kind of been legit with the medical. I had the appointment with the doctor, the whole thing. So, but yeah, they ended up taking that down and yeah, I was facing some, some pretty heavy charges there. So what transpired um uh, after that so i remember i was pretty pretty spooked out they like i hadn't had the i didn't really know what to do i was kind of in limbo but when finally the police kind of came and found me um a while later but before that i was just i was so stressed out and like kind of losing it and i met with this attorney who was going to maybe help out and he pretty much just, you know, first thing was like, yo, you need to just chill because what has happened has happened. You messed up. And yeah, you could do two years. Probably not. It could, it's most likely going to be this, this, or this. And he was like, but either way, you're just going to like wearing yourself down. So like, that's where they kind of shifted the whole perspective a little bit on it. And instead of like, oh, poor me, like, this is horrible. Like, what am I going to do? And because a lot of it was, like, with the snowboarding. I would finally got to this point with snowboarding where I was, like, able to do – I had the support and was able to do it the way I wanted. And I was, like, looking at the potential of that being taken away and not being able to do that. And then when that switched, you know, I was like, well, I did it, though. Like, that part in dopamine and that whole experience was, like, so far above and beyond – in my, my goals and aspirations as a kid, it was just, um, unreal. And so I was kind of like, they can't take that away. They can keep me from doing it again or doing more for the next few couple of few years, whatever, but they can't like stop me completely. And then once I kind of shifted into that mindset and I was like, you know, heck, that wouldn't be too bad probation. Like I just stay in Montana. Like I've always wanted to spend more time in Montana. So, like, soon as just the power of the positive thought when you're like, oh, everything's going so wrong, I'm going to go to jail, like, this is bad, and then you're like, kind of switch it a little, and for my uh, my whole mental state, that was, like, a huge help, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, I guess it, it gets more, more interesting from there, but um, I was kind of, yeah, starting to feel a little better about it then. Um, and I could go into more about how, where it went from there. Cause that almost kind of doesn't seem real. Yeah. That's when the rest of this is almost like reality is uh stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. So 
I mean, that's always makes for good stories. Yeah, because it's funny when um, I talked with you the other day, even I kind of forgotten about this. Even it was so long ago and so <laughs> crazy. It was like so disassociated with, it, disconnected from it. Um, but yeah, like so, I remember pretty specifically. Like I was feeling better. I was like staying at my folks' house. And like a family friend came by, he was helping my parents out with something. And, you know, he was in having a really hard time. He'd just gotten a DUI and was looking at all these charges and fines and the whole gamut of that. Right. And I was, you know, sorry to hear that, you know, I was kind of trying to soothe him a little bit. And then I was like, if it makes you feel any better, like, here's what I'm looking at, you know, and I explain what I'm the charges and stuff I'm looking at. And he's like, Oh, dang, yeah, well, I guess I do feel a little better about my situation. And then he invited me to go on a sailing trip across Flathead Lake, which is this beautiful lake in my neck of the woods there. Um, it's pretty well known for sailing because the, the way the thermals come off the mountains and everything. But um, so it's been like my first time since this whole arrest really like doing anything fun, you know, going with hanging out with friends or going to do something interesting and um so yeah we sail across the lake it was pretty awesome kind of just let a lot of these worries melt away because you know it's in the rear view for now and then um then we we go across the lake and now we're actually we're on another indian reservation it's different than the reservation i was at and we were on in polson at the kootenai salish and i remember it was the first time that it had happened since i'd been around like other like native people and seen native Americans again, and I remember that it was like, oh, it kind of reminded me, oh, that all did really happen, and it's very real, and you were out there um, in Blackfeet country doing something you weren't supposed to be, and um, so I remember getting a little nervous, but I was like, kind of enjoyed myself, um, there was like some music playing and some stuff, and then as the kind of night was winding down, like my friends, they just like went to sleep on the boat, and we were going to stay the night there, and then sail back in the morning. And yeah, this, um, this is just so bizarre. But then I met these, um, there's like a wedding going on between a Blackfeet and a Kootenai Salish member. They were getting married, like they had a little after reception or whatever. So there was people gathered and there's these two women smoking. And I just started talking with them. Mind if I hang out for a minute? And we got to talking and it was so crazy because Um, The one woman knew Danny Cass because when Danny and the Dingo came to Montana doing their the Dingo show or whatever, the Fuel TV thing, Mm -hmm. and she worked like PR for the tribe. And so they contacted her to like organize a visit. Um, And so it like instantly like felt like there was this kind of like bond or like I was like, oh, that's crazy. Like you kind of know someone from my world like how bizarre and like he still would send her christmas cards and stuff it was like this really cool thing um so it definitely like kind of made me feel more comfortable and then i because i hadn't really told too many people that that what i the trouble i was in and i figured like they were from out there like she'd even worked at the tribe out there and i was like here's my situation like what do you think like how bad is it (laughs) you know and they were like oh like so casual like it's fine. Like they always mess it up. Like the evidence or the whatever the sheriff doesn't show up. The officer doesn't show up. Like the County is so loose, you know, it'll probably just fall through the cracks. And I was like, all right, well, <laughs> I love the optimism. You know, doubt it's like, you know, get to that level disappear. But, and then she's, you know, we're talking a little more hanging out and then she's like, well, you know what? My, my boss is here. Montana state senator and tribal councilman and I'll introduce you to him and maybe he could help. And I'm just like, Whoa, like <laughs> oh, there's a turn sure. of events. And so next thing you know, I'm like cheers in like tequila shots and Bud Light with the Montana state senator <laughs> who out of respect, I'll <laughs> remain nameless. But however, like we kind of hit it off as well. And He's like, hey, you know, she explained a little bit about your scenario, the trouble you might be in. Why don't you come come down to my office on Monday and see if I can help you out? And, yeah, so I was 
beyond grateful. I was just like ecstatic, like, holy cow. This is like this light shining in this like really, really dark situation. Like there's kind of a a path now, I feel like, you know, a window through this. And um, yeah, so I mean, from there, just out of, I guess, being thorough, I guess, I'll, uh, I'll share what <laughs> happened next. Um, but, you know, I, I thanked her actually for introducing me to the senator and like, wow, this is like such an incredible turn of events. It's like, I'm like indebted to you, I feel like. Is there anything, like, let me know if there's, I could ever help you with anything. Like, you know, I remember thinking like, babysitting or like to the ride of the airport or pickup or whatever it was kind of the, f- the the scope of things I was picturing then she says well actually you could fuck me <laughs> <laughs> and that's when my heart literally sank because I was just like gosh um anything else that we can you know anything else that can any other way I can help you and I don't know, for whatever reason, it turned out that was the only way I could help. Um, and flash forward after some sort of like kind of trying to weasel out of the whole idea. But flash forward, here we are in the back of a, her pickup truck in the Quintucknuck Indian Casino. And I'll spare the rest of those details. However, I barely remember them myself. But um <laughs> <laughs> Um, a lot of tequila shots that night with the senator. Um, but yeah, so from there, I just crawled back to the boat, um, <laughs> woke up next to the boys and they're like, oh, how was your night? And I was like, <laughs> you will never guess yeah. what happened. And I just yeah. told them the whole story and they're just like, oh my God. Like, um, so that was a funny sail back, you know, we'd sail back and. Yeah, kind of a took a you kind of process that the rest of that weekend. Mm-hmm. So, unreal. Did you end up getting off the charges? Well, yeah. So I ended up meeting with the senator, and he offered. He was able to directly help me, but he offered me his attorney mm. information, <clears throat> um, which is an absolute legendary human being, Joe McKay on the Blackfeet in the reservation and he does a ton of pro bono stuff out there helping people. So, I mean, this, um, this connection was, I don't even know how to explain it. This was like something beyond, beyond like what I could even wrap my head around when I walked into this man's home and just the, the wave of calm that rushed over me, was just, it was incredible. I knew at that point, right when I walked in, met him, that this was all good. The fact that he took me on as a client and was willing to help me, um, I mean, that is one of the gifts, like through this whole situation that helped me out, helped me through this. Um, Cause yeah, the reality was, and even meeting with that first attorney, how he explained best case scenario, worst case scenario. We went so far better than best case scenario um, because he he worked with those people out there. He knew the attorneys, the judges and everything. And they deal with a lot of domestic abuse, a lot of drugs and meth problems. And a small thing like this, it's a small thing. um, And given my character and the, my career path and everything was, was going so well. It was like, he pretty much, it pretty much just disappeared. Like what they technically it's called a deferred prosecution. So normally a lot of people like they're, they get a good thing. It's like deferred sentence. And if you mess up, then they'll actually sentence you where this was like, they stopped it before that. So Mm -hmm. I'd have to mess up so bad a couple more times for this really to like, come back to me. And I was, I'd learned so much through that experience and was just so happy and thankful to like be through it. Um, like it didn't seem like it was, I had, you know, pretty clear was on like a good path to like, um, stay, stay on a good path with them. So amazing. Well, 
while we're on this uh, subject of storytelling and things like that, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know how this chronological order stuff goes. We we don't we go out of order. We go wherever it needs to. But talking on the phone, you know, um, I know you had a stint of uh, train hopping, or as you like to call it, mm. urban backpacking. <laughs> I'd love you to explain urban backpacking. Why? How? When? What's the deal with it? Yeah, Chris, you bet, man. Um, it's a you know, it's something I've always kind of been fascinated with. Um, as a kid, Whitefish is a train town. Like, we're on the High Line. It's one of the, like, the main stops. So there's always trains coming through. In the summertime, you'd see, you know, people. I never saw the people on the train, but, like, you knew that's kind of how they got there. They're camped out by the river, by the tracks, whatever. Um, I've kind of always been fascinated with that sort of idea or hobo culture. Never really knew much about it until I met hillbilly hobo and that's that's a whole story in itself and i remember i was just going um to, just ran to the rode the bike to the gas station to grab a couple beverages going back to my trailer to, um for the night just kind of chill out and there's this guy at the crosswalk and he i think he asked me he asked me if i had any weed and i was like no actually like i've been been off you know i've been off so i don't um, and then I just kind of started pedaling off and like, he just looked so down and out and I made it like another like block down and I turned around and was like, something told me to, to talk to this guy, you know, and, um, invite him in. And so I was like, yeah, like I said, I don't have what you're looking for, but I got a few beers we can go hang out and, you know, if you want to chat, so I'm going to talk to, you know, looks like you're a long way from home and had it pretty rough and. Yeah, and sure enough, because he uh, he before that, I guess he told me he had just got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, or they had some suspicions he may may have that, and he was in a pretty rough place. So we just kind of hung out; it was just like camaraderie. Um, and then, yeah, he started talking. He had hobo life tattooed on his knuckles, and then I was like immediately kind of asking him about it, like, "What's up?" You know, and he explained this whole like another world that I didn't know, the Hobo National Convention, the Hobo King and Queen, and the Hobo Jungles and Hobo Stew, and, like, pretty much everything Hobo you can imagine. And I'm just like, this is insane. Like, where does this even come from? And then, so we're chilling, and, like, long story short, I end up um, inviting them to, I'm going to Mount Hood for the Bodhi Mini, um, mini the quarter pipe one. Yep. And I'm like, hey, dude, like, I'm going to Mount Hood tomorrow if you want to go and he's like i love oregon so and leland's driving and like we show up to leland's like four hours late like i got this homeless guy with me and we're like oh we're ready like drive through the night leland drives through the night to mount hood we do the whole event there and the whole time he's telling me all these hobo stories and train life and traveling like that and yeah and then after that weekend he was just in love with the snowboard community he said it was so similar to what he experiences in his world and like the camaraderie of like, you might not see these people in months or years, but like you run into them here and it's like old pals just pick up where you left off and blah, 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 like that whole deal. And he just loved it. And he was like, Eric, he was a huge Eric Leon fan. He watched Eric and was like, that's the dude, <laughs> which wow. I was like, heck yeah, for sure. Um, so that was cool. But yeah, after that we went home the whole deal and he was like, Hey, I want to, you shared your world with me. I want to share mine. Like, I want to take you on a train riding trip, show you how to ride a freight train. I was like, dude, okay. All right. And then it was crazy. So when I actually came down to it though, like I couldn't find him anywhere. He didn't have a phone, you know, like I, I looked at his little local spots, went all around town, had, I had my bag packed. I was like, what do I pack for the urban backpacking trip? Like no tent, you know, like a sheet or something. I don't know. So had the pack and was looking for him, thinking we'd make this happen. And then I couldn't find him anywhere. I was just like camped on the grass down by where I, I'd last seen him camping. Right, it's right by the train tracks. And he taught me enough of like, I'd kind of had an idea how to do it safely and what trains to get on, what to avoid and whatnot. And it was pretty late at that point. I was just like laid down to go to sleep and I heard a train coming up. It coming. I was like kind of like getting excited. And I was like, fuck, there's no way I'm going to do this by myself though. Like he's not here. Like I can't just do it. And then I was like, I was looking. I was like, oh, it's the right train because you need the like the train with the double stack train 
they're, you know, they're like going, they're not just going to break apart in some little train yard. They're going like all the way to Minneapolis or Chicago or whatever. And, uh, yeah, I just got all excited and saw that it was the right type of train. And it just was like maybe my moment to do it. And I just went for it. And I got on the train and I'm like, they call it a piggyback. I learned later, but it's like the semi truck on the train trailer, like flatbed trailer. I was like, that's the perfect spot. I'm just like tucked up, hid, hidden in the wheels or whatever. And it's paused for a couple minutes and then it's just like, chung, chung, and we're going chung, chung, <laughs> a little quicker and quicker each time. And like I see all the railroad workers in their little office and we just keep going keep going leave the whole train yard and we're just keep going accelerating accelerating yeah. and it was just like that was like the beginning of this just insane personal experience of like being on my own figuring this out how to get all the way out there battling the elements and the, the railroad police and like so many every day it was like odds were so stacked it felt like some point you're ready to just give up and like go home but you'd kind of like, oh, I'm not ready. I got to like push and see what I got to make it, you know? And like, it just would be so rewarding. Then you'd figure out how to get back on in that town and get out of town. You're just like so proud of yourself. And it's like so exciting and pretty weird. I don't know. You know, it's like, but people who have done it, like they kind of, a lot of them, they kind of live, live for it. It's like a pretty, pretty unique and exhilarating way to travel. Yeah. How long did you do that for? Well, it was like a month trip it ended up being, and I rode the train out um, to Minneapolis, hitchhiked down to Britt, Iowa, made it to the Hobo National Convention without my buddy, Shit. but I was there. Yeah. I was the only one who actually rode a freight train there. It's like, mostly it's like old retired, or not retired hobos, but yeah, like people more like retired at age that used to like travel like this, and it's their way to come back together and sort of celebrate the old times and the memories. Wow. <laughs> and I just Yo, show I, up. I, I rode the train here. Yeah. <laughs> and they were, like, people were blown away. They were so proud and impressed. Like, you have no idea what you're doing, and you made it. Like, you're either, like, really smart or really lucky or something. I don't know. So, But it was a really cool, quite the experience. Wild. Did some of, pe of the people at the convention know your friend? Is it sort of like... Yeah, they, yeah, totally. So a few people know him. They just call him Hillbilly. And yeah. he's got hobo life on his knuckles yeah. mm -hmm. hillbilly hobo i mean he has a real name but that's part of the the rules of the road like yeah. you don't have a your real name they don't yeah. tell their what's real your names. real what's your name yeah, what's yours danger <laughs> <laughs> perfect name dude uh wow that's good stuff i, I was thinking about something earlier because you were talking about dopamine and how you literally and figuratively were coming off of alaska and you had this gigantic dopamine dump essentially mm -hmm. i myself have never been to alaska and ridden those lines and gotten psycho and done back sevens off of like giant 80 foot fingers in the middle of a spiny line so anyway i've never i don't know what that experience is like but to me it seems like the the biggest dopamine rush you can get on a snowboard is that accurate with riding big lines? Alaska, yeah. Alaska? Oh, yeah, Alaska by far. I mean, it's so – the train's so big. I mean, it can be really challenging and potentially consequential. So, like, yeah, and then you have the helicopters involved, if was, or especially when you have the helicopters involved, which adds such a crazy pace to it all. I would say even it's more the – hell, almost as much the helicopter as it is Alaska itself because even those, like, BC or wherever you were, like those – kind of run and gun sunny alpine heli days are all kind of a crazy dopamine kind of adrenaline rush so so it's almost like it's almost like if you're into like hiking a down bar that's like you know if you're into riding park that's kind of like smoking weed and then like riding alaska is like crystal meth basically it's like a whole nother it's like it's like a totally different it's the gateway yeah the gateway like, to the the real yeah. yeah, it's hard. The hard drug. It's not, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hardcore. It's hardcore. Yeah, Justin was telling me, I mean, maybe it was dopamine year that Manuel yeah. was also kind of in the same position as you as far as like getting on the crew. And you guys rode a lot, right? 
Yeah, we wrote a ton year. that season. Yeah, and he, I mean, I've always looked up to his writing too. What an incredible writer. How was Same. it writing with Manuel? <clears throat> I mean, explain that a little bit. Did you guys I'm, push each other? Incredible. Well, yeah, that's a good that's a good question, Mikey, cuz it's funny to think back cuz I would always I would see some of the stuff he would do and the places he was getting dropped off and how fast he was riding these runs and how big of errors he was taking. Mm -hmm. And it's just like Dude, you are so insane. And then I don't know if it's just like a little different approach, but like, because he saw my riding and he like he thought I was insane. Yeah. So it was like, okay, so wait, he, I think he's insane. He thinks I'm insane. So like, how insane is this? Yeah. Um, kind of so, lose, lose perspective. Yeah. So I think it did allow us to like kind of progress into the maybe a little uncharted waters in a mm. way, just because we were at that point and we were in it together to kind of like, cause you know, there's a couple of times you'd be like, he'd asked me like, is this, is this too much? And I was like, dude, if anyone has got this, it is you bro. Mm -hmm. And I have full confidence. You're going to kill this line. Yeah. And sure enough, dude, just like, I remember those scene when we flew away, there's this line called <laughs> Dr. Seuss and Haynes. And it's just this like, I don't even know what you would look at. It, you're like, where do you go? <laughs> and like the thing is, it's just this pinnacle up there, and I'd never seen him like so so like afraid looking. Like the thing flew away. I mean, not even I don't think he was this like he was, four inches step. He's just a tiny tiny, and we just fly away, and he's just this little guy on this huge gnarly thing, dude. And he wrote it so sick that I was just like, wow. Like, so yeah, hats off to Manuel Diaz. Dude, I love you, bro. Like, whew. let's give him a super. Huh? super yes, yeah. please. All right, so let's get into, you know, Absinthe, you had dopamine, intro to Absinthe, killed it. Let's talk about your ender. Uh, Ever since? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you ha you hit the streets, and then you hit AK. You kind of was did everything, you know? And uh, double back rodeos on cheese wedges. And and uh, I guess, you know, talk about getting ender, but I know there's one... Is the is the Japan spine lines where you back three? Was that in Trans World or was that in? That's absent. Yeah, that's absent. Was that that same year? Yeah, yeah. Maybe tell the story behind that back because I don't think did you land it or did you? That guy butt check. Butt check. Like, yeah, yeah. But you, it's like a ninety foot back it's three. Huge. It's the biggest like drop I've ever taken for <laughs> sure. Dude, it's psycho. Um, yeah, tell the story behind that. But yeah, so that one we had a bit of a lot of snow moving that season and. Um, but yeah, that, so that was kind of a crazy one because we'd been on the, I think that was off the couch 14 days, down days in a row. Didn't snowboard, maybe snowboarded a couple days, like with the sleds, just kind of playing around, but like, we didn't do any filming or anything for two weeks. You're just kind of like, so pent up. You're up there to film, do this thing, snowboard, haven't done it in a while. And I'd, I'd actually had ridden that line before, and it's like such it's such a pretty spine coming down, and then it just terminates at this like huge cliff, and it was like this perfect takeoff and everything. And I did it once before, a little more timid, not not as full send, and I just straight aired it, and then it was uh, didn't quite land it, but then we came back the, the fourteen days later, or maybe it was even longer, but it was fourteen days off. And I do that just – that was the first run of the day, and it was like, here we go. And I remember, like, that whole thing, and I land and butt check, and the, it, like, triggers this, like, little storm slab, and then I'm just – all the snow's moving with me, and I'm just, like, in this, like, big wave whitewater kind of feeling, like, coming down. And I remember at the premieres, I remember that one got crazy because you're like, is he going to – he like, disappear, and then, I'd like, head would pop out, and it's just all this crazy stuff happening. And then – but, like, I made it out, and I remember – Justin gets on the radio because he's like pretty quiet about the stuff a lot of the times with that. And then he was like, Psh, how was that for a warm up run? You know, like, yeah. Psh, like, holy dude, it was insane. So you're not a big, you're not a big warm up run guy. You're just right out of the gate. Uh, ready, ready, fire aim. Well, I mean, when you're up there for that, it's like you're ready because yeah, we don't really, we wouldn't get warm up runs, you know, because mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're working with the heli. We don't have this huge heli budget to like rent the whole heli and do your own thing, take some warm up laps. Like you get the 
heli for an hour or two in the morning, be productive, get the shot, or at least get the shot at the shot. And then, you know, in the evening was kind of the same thing. So it wasn't like, yeah, you don't have a ton of time. To, but you, you don't necessarily want it. You're the warm-up. You're so, like, you've been thinking about little else for the last week mm-hmm. but doing what you're about to do. So mm-hmm. it's like you're ready. So you knew you wanted to go back to this spot and potentially throw something off of it. Yeah, it did, it just looked perfect the way yeah. it swooped for the back three. And yeah. immediately, though, when I was in the air, I was just like, Oh my <laughs> gosh, this is probably twice as high as I've ever been in the wow. air. Like, how is this going to work out? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, you mentioned earlier off air that, like, you know, you'd hit another huge jump, which you can see on your Instagram, that huge straight air. And, yep. you know, thinking that maybe spinning would be a little less scary. Is that still your perspective? Would you rather straight air or spin off something massive? Well, if it hits a park thing, it's definitely a. A, a spin mm-hmm. like a front three or something yeah. you know but with like the more the natural stuff if it's powder and not like a classic jump like i'm pretty i'm like most comfortable in an ollie wow scenario cool that's uncommon i would say i think a lot of people i've talked to would rather chuck and not see it the whole time yeah well i think i'm thinking more like for more technical riding when you're like jumping in to like transfer something yeah. i just like and that's the stuff I'm drawn to the most. But yeah, like I don't know, if hitting a huge like moon ramp jack or cheese wedge yeah. with a straight air is like not really gonna happen. Yeah. Even if you tried, it probably yeah. wouldn't work. Yeah. Um, so obviously you're tricking that one. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah. What what video was that straight air and you're talking about? I don't know. That's the same. That's all that same year ever since. Okay. Yeah. Ever since. Yeah. That talk, was in Italy. T- um, talk us through that that massive ollie where it looks like you're falling out of the sky. It literally just to we should put this on the screen because yeah. it, it literally looks fake. It looks like you're on a hoverboard. <laughs> for it, it really looks like CGI. Cool. It's nuts. Um, wow. Yeah, that was a big one. Um, that was that was in Italy. Like the crew was <laughs> Vlad was showing us around. David Vladica, Absolute wow. Euro, the man with out. all the spots. Yeah, the Swiss big bro. Love you. Um, but yeah, he was showing us around. And Justin was with us, of course. Um, we had Worm, Garrett Warnick, Vole. Vole actually, like, he kind of saw this thing and was, like, looking up at it. I think he almost, like, joked, like, could you hit? Like, look at that. But, like, the thing actually, like, it looked like a shot just jumping off of the jump, like, to what was right below it. Mm-hmm. Would still could have got yeah, a sick like clip. Yeah. But then it was like, oh, there's, like, a little knoll way down there. And I remember it was so, <laughs> dude, it was so tense, the whole setup. Like, I remember feeling bad later because I was kind of, I was kind of snappy a little with the crew because I was just so, so tense, like setting it up. Like, how do I, what kind of angle? Like, and then like the light, of course, it's because the light's fading. So yeah. now I can't just like chill and set this up the way I want, exact, take my time. All of a sudden there's this like, urgency sense of urgency and panic and it's like oh. <laughs> i'm like oh my god so i get up there and it's like i mean those are the heart some of the most challenging things are like how much speed do you take into something like this you know like where do you start you have this whole mountain so you start at the top and see how it feels you know and then like coming into it so yeah that was like a total mind trip like getting into it but then like dude just it was so sick like that was the coolest funnest like funnest air like i didn't even know like i felt like i had a bait like a base jump rig i could have thrown it at one yeah. point and just flown like flown down to the valley it or whatever like you were you were attached to something flying like a flying vehicle and i love what you're saying there too about in the crew i think we've probably all been there at a spot where you just are ready and people aren't quite ready yet and there's just this anxiety but we i've had it other riders do it to me yeah. and been like the rider feels bad. The whole crew knows exactly totally. what you're going through. Yeah, they were all you like, know, oh, we get it. Like, we don't, care. don't worry. Like, yeah. no stress. And then yeah. I was like, obviously, you're about to launch, like, your biggest jump. You probably be a, might be a little tense mm-hmm. about yeah. it. But it, it worked. I remember walking away from that, not even thinking we got the shot because Justin wasn't that hyped on it, the way I shifted kind of. Mm-hmm. But then once we saw it on the screen and everything, it was just like, dude, this is this was pretty cool, mm-hmm. actually. So with the ender part, uh, kind of, I feel like that's like a pinnacle career deal, right? Like, you know, absent ender, you know, for video part people, you know, like myself put a lot of, like, that's like 
the goal in life was like get an ender you know mm-hmm. at least for me like that was yeah. something that i didn't know if it's ever attainable and so you know are there any notable things from that year that you want to talk about or or, or things that we should bring up with that you mean in the, with the riding or in the in general either either way you know like is there things from that year you want to talk about well like that's like it wasn't it wasn't just randomly that I ended up with this incredible part, you know, like I set that intention going into the season. I was like mentally in a, in a place like such a good place. Um, everything was kind of lined up. I was feeling so strong and like I was getting decent support. So I was kind of like, I'm filming with absinthe films. Like if I turn on this year, like get like an end part or something, you know, I could like, and so I kind of like set that in, intention was like this is you're going full on this one and that's why i like decided to do the urban stuff early even though that was like pretty hard on your body doing a a month or two of urban stuff and then like trying to reset and kind of like charge that hard in the mountains but but um that worked out pretty well but it was like yeah just that commitment level i think it was just this is all I wasn't in a relationship or anything at that point. I was just like, this is all focus on this. And yeah, and put it all out there. So what happened sponsor-wise after that? After that? It's, uh, that's kind of a... Or you had Transworld the next year, right? Well, yeah. I mean, after that season, um, the the sponsor thing got, it did get a little weird. um, Because I remember... Like I was up, my Mervin contract was up for, like up to resign or whatever that spring. I pretty much timed out with the end of the season, and I'd kind of blew all, spent all my money on that part, and then even like kind of racked up a little, little debt with the Hellies to like chip away at. So I was like, went full in with the finances as, as well as the time, energy, focus, and I remember kind of thinking coming back, you know, it's like. I rode for Mervyn since I was maybe 15 or 14 and had built all the way up to this point with this career. And I just kind of thought it was a, it was kind of just a re re, an easy re-sign situation. Um, So I didn't really stress on the, on the money at all. And then, yeah, when I got home and kind of settled in and I remember talking to Burtner and he was like, yeah, it's kind of tough over here. It it might be a good time to look for a new board sponsor. And I remember just like, like, dude, that just like was so shocking because I started riding for those guys. I was so young and I just never pictured not riding a lib tech. Like that was kind of it. And then I don't know. And I think so after that, it was just, it was really a strange feeling. And I think there was maybe, I don't know if it's a, like a trust that was broken or like something or like the shine of, of the snowboard career just kind of got a little like tarnished, mm-hmm. you know, cause I was like, here I am. I did it. This is like what I've been working for the last 20 years. And then to feel like there wasn't like the support didn't kind of like mm-hmm. reflect that. So, but yeah, no hard feelings in it. And it's really all good. And then like later on, actually, like after everything came out, they were able to like put together a little budget to keep me flowing on the boards, but it was like, pretty dramatically reduced from before, you know, and, and kind of a, yeah, I don't know, kind of a tough, tough pill to swallow. But, um, and I think honestly that like after that, it kind of, things did kind of shift in my head a bit. Cause it was like, you know, I did everything. And then some that I ever wanted to do with snowboarding covers absent ender, like, Oh my God. And then it kind of felt like, the industry didn't, it wasn't the same thing. So I was same sort of reflect that. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to do this more for myself. Hmm. And I think at that point I, I didn't, wasn't like active, but I think I just put a lot less energy into like Mark, any marketing extra extracurricular marketing of the brands. And I just kind of felt a little, like a little slighted. So I was just kind of like, you know, um, which in hindsight, it wasn't, you know, these things happen. And, and now I've like moved through through it, and and I'm like I'm good with it, and it doesn't bother me at all. But, um, but yeah, that was like a little hiccup in that plan. 
Okay, so then you went on to film the trans world part where you built the tiny home, which is pretty in, in, uh, interesting. And what was the what was the thought process behind that? So that that was sort of um, it was all so that I could ride in Alaska, pretty much because I was like a single guy. You know, didn't have a down payment for a house, was looking to rent, was like a year lease here, this. And I'm like, none of this makes any sense. And then I had, I started living on this dude's, f- like, back 10 of his acres, like, in a tent for a few months as I was, like, trying to figure out building something or doing something. And then my homie, big shout out to Scott Thomas, he's like... I call him up. I'm like, dude, it's getting cold out here in the tent. Like, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out to build a yurt or something to stay in. And that's when he and he was like, hey, there's, they're so hard to insulate it and keep it dry in this weather. Like, but there's this like aluminum box that uh, down the street for sale for a few hundred bucks. We could like convert it into a cabin for you. And it's like an aluminum box off an old delivery truck from like the 50s. Um, and we showed up. It was like pretty ratted and like, this crazy chain thing. And dude, he helped me turn that thing into like a sweet little cabin, like real, real quality craftsmanship and woodworking. And and, like in the process, I learned so much from him, like without that kind of work and just like as a life mentor and like, um, yeah, so he's a great homie. And that's who kind of sparked that. I was never going to put it on a trailer. It was just going to have it towed tow truck, bring it out to that property. I was renting a, the dude's lot back of his lot for 75 bucks. And I was just in with the farm animals. There was like three horses <laughs> and like a bunch of goats and like dogs and chickens running around. And I was just like back in the, the pig pen with all of them pretty much. And I was like pretty but, happy with pretty it. Pretty good though. rent though. 75 yeah. Bucks. Yeah. Nice. It was nice. It ain't bad. They called yeah. me the villager. Cause they were like, he put this ad on Craigslist and like, I was the only one crazy enough to like move on. Cause people would call and be like, so what, what are the utilities or amenities? It's like nothing. It's just a plot of land. You can just set up a tent or build a shack or whatever. But yeah, so that so I ended up, yeah, putting on a trailer instead. And then that kind of evolved into like, yeah, doing the whole trip up to Haynes with it. And and I've always been pretty passionate about the diesel and like alternative fuels. And now I, I don't I think it's all a bit more greenwash now the kind of idea like i can't say i'm 100 percent for all of it now but but that i just love that idea of growing your own fuel and like mm-hmm. reusing the waste grease mm-hmm. in a truck you know it was such a cool yeah is that concept you, to me you had a grease truck at that time <laughs> yeah oh, sick yeah it was my homie Corey wagner big shout out he got into that stuff super young right out of high school moved to norcal and he's the one that got me into the biodiesel and all that and so that was like my plan for that season was like, I'm gonna, f- I'm not just gonna go film this crazy part, because I did that last year, and um, I want to do this. So I like finished my trailer, and I was still riding, but not like a ton, and got the veggie truck going, and like put it, put all this emphasis on this big trip to Haynes, and was trying to do my own project with the homie and it all kind of, it was kind of a crazy story how it all fell through. But like, let's see, like, and then talking with Shane recently, cause I was like that trip, just pulling the trip off was a huge milestone and such a gamble and so much work. Like I didn't know what I was doing and converted it all myself. We made it, made the grease myself or filtered the grease myself. We drove all the way up there and it all worked, you know, but like, the filming project side of it kind of fell to the wayside of the actual experience of it, mm-hmm. I think. And then there was like some, a couple pretty rough kind of traumatic events on that trip too, that kind of like really kind of put the nail and we weren't really experienced enough to pull it off, I think in the first place. And then I just checked out, um, after those two avalanche events, um, that was pretty much like the end of that project. Do you want to elaborate on that at all? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the first one was, was Bodie's burial. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a pretty, that was my, like I'd never seen anyone buried in an avalanche before. And like, that's that whole experience was pretty 
eye-opening and shocking um, of how quick things can go bad out there. And two, just seeing the face they were on, it's like, it, for Haynes, it was kind of like a mini golf zone. And just to think, you know, that he was buried 1.8 meters. Wow. Um, in just such a small face, just the wrong terrain and trap kind of situation. Um, but yeah, like that whole experience kind of rocked me a little bit. Um, and I haven't like really talked, we didn't, I mean, even though I've been hanging out with him, it's kind of, it doesn't come up in conversation, but, um, yeah, it was a pretty crazy experience. Um, but it was incredible. Like Alaska heli skiing, like, holy cow. And the greater snowboard and film community, like saved, saved Bodie. It was incredible the how much snow we moved and how effective and efficient it was um because they literally we were in a different spot we weren't with that crew mm. and like we were with the lead guide though and so he got the call and i could tell like stark white he was like militant all of a sudden something completely changed and he told us we got to get in the heli and we got to go and they explained to us what's happening on the way the whole time I had no idea it was bodie who was in there. And it wasn't actually until seeing, cause I knew I saw him and John Ray had the same snow pants. And as we're digging wow. at one point, I, like I see John Ray snow pants and I see those snow pants and I'm like, Oh my God, we're digging for Bodie. Like we dug, I don't even know how long before I even didn't even know it was him who was in there. But yeah, so we like, we showed up, they were already digging, like hadn't gotten to him yet. They had the probe and everything. So we were there like a couple minutes after the burial wow. and we just start going shoveling and like replace the guys that are there. And then like, you didn't even know it was, you're just so focused on this. The whole time the heli was taking off and picking up other crews, coming back, dropping them off. All wow. of a sudden it was like, there's like 20 people all just excavating, dude. And then it's crazy. Cause yeah, they got, um, the probe strike hit him right in the forehead. So when you saw him, he was blue and he was bleeding out his like, looked like his eye. So you didn't really know. And then. Yeah, it was crazy though. But as soon as they got him, got like a little more snow off him, it was like, <gasps> wow. So he'll take a breath. And it was like, holy cow. It was still like pretty tense, but still everything like really calmed down. And then, yeah, we just like literally like someone took a board off of bindings off the board and we just like slid them out of this hole and put them in the heli. And we're just were like, later, buddy. And we're all just there, just like, holy fuck, dude. Like, that was insane. And I don't know, maybe some people there had been involved in a burial or like a rescue, but I hadn't, and my crew hadn't, and it was, it was pretty wild. Yeah. And then, and then, so that, so processing that, you know, and we're still going out like filming, you know, and like kind of taking these risks. Um, but so I'm working through that whole experience. And then it was just like, I it wasn't a week later. It was less than a week. I'm pretty sure. Um, when Estelle Ballet was killed in an avalanche, she's a Swiss, free rider, free ride world tour champ. She was like three time champ. And that whole story of how that went down and everything just um, was very upsetting, I think. Cause she was young, like 22. And she was out with all these very experienced rider, um, filmers and writers, a very experienced crew. And yeah, then the way this, the slide broke like she was riding up so big exposure and it fractured and she went over the cliffs and like from the story i've heard it broke on the the alps they'll get that sahara sand that was the layer it broke on and it just seems so obvious if you dug a pit or were any suspicious of the snowpack and you saw like a layer of dirt or sand sediment like you probably wouldn't ride above the exposure and she was so young and inexperienced in that she'd only done the contest setting Mm -hmm. And here you are in these big mountains. And two, I think part of me, this really turned me into a funk, I think, because it was like, I'm putting, like that part I put out the year before, so much avalanche footage, like snow moving. Mm -hmm. And people see that, you know, and are like, maybe not consciously like, oh, I'm going to do that. But it's like, it, it, it raises maybe their risk tolerance a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying like, because I wrote all these crazy things, triggered these avalanches, that she was caught in an avalanche and died, but it does play with your head a little. Mm -hmm. And so I think those two things happening so close to each other was just, it was like too much. And then it's like, 
kind of just sh- shut off. And that's how then that whole kind of project idea just kind of like disappeared. And I kind of like, yeah, kind of disappeared a little bit myself. Well, where'd you disappear uh-huh. to? <laughs> well, so there's the, there's, <laughs> I guess a good, let's keep it going. there's a good one. <laughs> so I already had this lined up like in the season. Mm-hmm. Like I knew this was my plan afterwards. Cause my buddy Guy Zollner, legend, um, Big Mountain Ripper, um, and Wilderness Ranger for the Forest Service out of this magical place called Big Prairie, which still exists. It's in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, 33 miles in by trail from any direction. You're pretty much smack in the middle of this 2 million acre wilderness, and there's a little community out there of Forest Service work crew, and everything is supplied by mule or foot. You know, you're either hiking it in or it's coming in on the horse or mule. And as far as food and everything, like we grow, have a small garden and some catch fish, but like everything's coming in that way. They're doing all this trail crew, trail work out there. And earlier that season, as a result of like an article from that Big Mountain Rider of the Year Award, the local paper did an article. My buddy Guy read it. He's like, dude, you're the perfect. He was like in need of a new person out, um, like a right, his like kind of right hand guy out there at the station to, um, called the station guard or station manager. He's like, I'm looking for a new hire. You're like, the handiwork is there. The, the wilderness love is there. Like, you want to do it? It's like kind of a commitment. I know your snowboard career is like pretty full on right now, but, and, I remember having some doubts and was like, you know, maybe next year just because it is like snow. And he's like, I don't know if this is going to be available or what. So now I was just I talked to a few friends. like, this is such an insane opportunity. Like, you've got to do it. I was like, you're right, dude, full on. So, yeah, I spent 100. I was the station guard at Big Prairie Ranger Station in, what, 2015 maybe, 16? And um, life-changing experience, like, Never been on a horse once before that. Rode a horse in. 100 days later, working with the stock, and I, like, learned the ropes, literally, and got pretty good with the horses and just that whole environment and kind of fell in love with that kind of lifestyle, which kind of opened this this window of, like, a whole nother world to me. Not just the work and the industry or whatever, but, like, like, a simple quiet life can also be just as enjoyable if not more so you know because it's like at before I went out there I hadn't spent three months in one spot for years 10 years maybe and then here I am three months in one one spot you didn't go further than like a day trip you know 20 10 15 miles away so I never even came to the edge the wilderness and that was just like yeah, mind blown with that. Love that. So you had your phone out there, Instagram all the time and everything, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was uh you had to crank it though. You had a little crank. <laughs> yeah. But if you cranked it fast enough, you might get a little <laughs> little bar. No. <laughs> no, we had a um F what is it? 4 Oh, it's the radio station. We had FM or AM radio yeah. 600 Kerr country western out there and every once in a while you'd get this music coming from like vancouver or something it was like hip-hop like indian hip-hop like Punjab's jobs hip-hop or something those were pretty fun yeah, yeah. Made, made my own yeah you'd make your made my own uh gut rot wine rot gut wine it was like fruit wine and we let it yeah, ferment how fun. you do let that? it ferment yeah, yeah, yeah with the yeast the re- and the sugar talk recipe here yeah how, so, do you, how do you make it because yeah that's how that happened the one the packer came in with i called it late packers hooch because he came in with like a ton of rotten fruit because he was like a few days late and i'm like what am i supposed to do all this fruit and i got to throw some of it away it was too bad but the rest of it was just like chopped it up put it in a five gallon bucket with some extra sugar some yeast put a little lid on it and like you just kind of crack it once a day for a few weeks and yeah sure enough like <laughs> it, it worked. I remember having like I've got a photo of the kids like he's just drinking it straight out of the five gallon bucket, Amazing. just like oh my gosh, mm-hmm. it was like wild west out there. Unique dude. taste, I'm sure, but it worked. Yeah, it was a little, 
still had a little yeasty flavor. Could have probably fermented a little longer. But so you went in a snowboarder, left a cowboy in that that terrain, huh? That. Straight up, dude. Straight up. I came out just had the hat, the whole vibe, like the mules in tow. Like knew what I was doing. What yeah. about? I'm fascinated because I, you know, personally never really had the connection with nature when I was younger because I think it was just you're just like thinking about tricks. It can be scary. It can be whatever. Too. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And as you get older, like you, you grow to appreciate nature and feel more connected to it. For sure. Did you did you have any profound experiences where you felt deeply connected to nature out there? Oh man, I think just like getting into that rhythm of just being in one place, and yeah, I mean, there's literally nature all around you. The only signs of the outside world are the food coming in and the every once in a while the plane coming overhead, but it's like. Yeah, and like some of like the solo hiking trips, because you'd get these four day weekends out there, and you're already just like in this incredible spot. And most of the time, I just like go off and just hike for a few days and just solo and kind of like have that time. And yeah, it was. I mean, I'd always had an appreciation for nature, but I think it definitely deepened it a bit. And um, as far as any like moment in itself that was so profound, I'm on a blank but like the whole experience itself was like beyond and you mentioned never you rode your first horse in how was it getting to know or be because you mentioned earlier you were around the animals a lot too for sure how was that connecting with you know i've heard a lot i have a lot of friends that are in love with horses and other animals so yeah and and you know the fact that they do like um horse therapy and stuff is like it makes a lot of sense because it is such a calming thing you can't force anything with these. You can't force your will onto this horse. You have to meet it where it is and work with it, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, it kind of, you have to shift your perspective a little. Um, and yeah, I think it is just so healthy and being out, especially in that environment. And like, I think you're tapping into so much with the nature and the history and like, you know, the people, you know, we've evolved with these animals mm-hmm. too in a lot of ways. And like all this, so it's like their connection is, is pretty profound. And like you learn a lot about yourself too and how, you know, a lot of lessons, um, you know, patience obviously is a big one because mm-hmm. like you three miles an hour, that's the speed. When you're laid in a string of mules, that's like as fast as you're going to get anywhere, which, you know, yeah, when you're used to going – 75 is pretty slow <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's you go 30, down. 30, 33 miles. I mean, I'm not good at math. How long does it take to go three, 33 miles packing in? Yeah, it's like a, it's like 11, 12. It's, it's a full day. Like a lot of them do it in two days. So yeah, it'd be like yeah. a 12 hour mm-hmm. trip in. And then, and then you went on to, I mean, we should kind of stay on this because then you went on to kind of make a career out of horse packing for a few years, right? Yeah. So after that season, so that next season, um, after that, like, that's when, like, I'd, I'd met my current partner, Sierra, um, in Haynes that season with the tiny house and everything. And then we just had a, a crazy, amazing connection and just totally hit it off. And then, but it was like I was on a trip and already had all these plans. And then I, I left and then, but, like, ended up circling back and coming back um, to be with her. And then, so, like, when we left... Haynes for the, um, I was going to do that same job and try and bring them kind of more in the mix. We had them like set up with my trailer at the trailhead and I was like, had this horse I was leasing or borrowing to like run in and out quicker. And then it all kind of fell through, but like we were in that zone and then we found a job, not with the forest service, but with a private outfitter. And they were, dude, she got me in the door because they were looking for, I was like coming around like, hey, you guys need a packer or wrangler, whatever. They're like, oh, we're good. But we could use a cook. And I was, and like Sierra was like, do you cook? She's, and she's a great cook. So <laughs> she like stepped in, kind of got our foot in the door. And the next thing you know, I was kind of like, yeah, became this sort of right-hand guy with the packing and supplied all the river trips that summer and then the hunting camps that winter and like. Dude, I mean, it was gnarly. Like, one of the other packer got hurt, and, like, so I was doing all these camps at once. Like, I remember going back-to-back 20-hour days packing, and it's like you get back to the trail, unsaddle, trailhead, unsaddle, feed the stock, freaking sleep a couple hours, get up, 
catch them, saddle them, do it all again. And I remember the one time it was so crazy because I was so sleep deprived and I was having a dream. I was, I was on a horse and I had to pee. I was just peeing off the side of the horse. And I woke up and I was like kneeling off the side of the bed, just peeing. <laughs> <laughs> just in it. I was like, whoa. Um, yeah. So that, but, so yeah, I, that really like the stuff I learned with Guy for the Forest Service, that was like a foundation. And then there I was like thrown to the wolves and just like packing like 10, 12 mules, like crazy hours. And that gave me the experience and the kind of like um, rep, you know, at least the resume to get that job doing this packing for the park service, which is kind of like a prestigious job in that field. Like a lot of these people are work decades before they get like packing job. And it was like my third year. And I, I kind of had to earn, earn my, you know, spot with the Packers a little, they were kind of like, who is this guy? He doesn't, you know, doesn't even, they didn't, cause I told them, I don't, this is my third year doing this. I don't know. And they're like, but they, I like proved myself. And cause two, you're in the gnarly terrain out there in Yosemite and it's all rock. And so I think like my comfort in exposure and like steep terrain really helped me excel mm -hmm. there because yeah, it's like, it is gnarly. Yeah. Like, and if those horses go down or something like it's, it would be bad. Yeah. And so to explain, you know, my understanding, just correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're, you're on a horse. And you you have mules, and the the mules are carrying the supplies. So they got all bags with all whatever exactly. hunting fish, hunting trip, fishing trip. You're meeting them down the river or wherever at camp, and you're you're bringing supplies to places where motorized vehicles can't get to. Essentially, you bet. That's right? essentially the packing. And for the outfitter, that's exactly it. And then for the park service, it's like you're packing in the work crews and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, same idea: tools, whatever equipment, and so, food. You know. Mm -hmm. And the, in the, so the third year, you're actually back working at Yellowstone. Or Yosemite, yeah. Yosemite, yep. okay, Yosemite, yeah. Yeah, wow. and that was my first year, first and only year doing that mm -hmm. there. All right, J-Rob, we're going to change gears for a hot second. Um, Mikey, do you know what it's time for? I think it's time for Name That Video Bar. <laughs> Name That Video Part is presented... By Woodward. Woodward Park City. Mike, have you ever been there? I have, and it is fantastic. You know, I was wondering, I want to get better at riding park, but maybe like small jumps. Do you know if they have any of those? They do, and that's the only thing I hit there. There are the big jumps. You'll see the hot dogs like Sage, et cetera, going crazy. But I like it because I can, you know, get three feet above the ground, go mm -hmm. 10 feet. Feel One good. thing I wish they had, though, is there's not that many half pipes around anymore. I would just wish they had a half pipe. No, they do have an amazing half pipe. It's actually open as we speak. Wow, mm -hmm. that's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a bummer because when the snow melts, there's probably nothing to do there. That's the only thing. That kind no, of Chris, out. actually, you're wrong. There is mountain biking. There is skateboarding, both in and outside facilities, mm. year round. Mm. Wow, that's pretty good. But, you know, I was really thinking that if I could get good at, like, parkour, maybe that would help my snowboarding. But it's unfortunate that they probably don't have anything no, like that. No, no. Inside, there's all kinds of fantastic mm. facilities, including foam pits you can even train in the summer on your board or mm. skis, anything you're into. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was actually thinking I don't really want to go snowboarding today. I want to do something kind of fun, but I don't want to really snowboard on the hill. What if the family came out with kids? Would you be interested in taking them tubing? Yeah, I would love to do that. Do you know if there's anywhere I can do that? They have a tubing course. At where? Woodward Park City? Woodward Park Get City. Get out of town, nope, Mike. It's a blast. It sounds like a world-class place to go have fun. Pretty much anything you could dream up, it's there at Woodward, including delicious food. If you're an adult, you can enjoy an adult beverage. I mean, you name it. Well, I got to get up there and check out Woodward Park City. I heard it's only 15 minutes away from Salt Lake. You know, I, I clocked in at 14 from my house, Chris. All right. Well, J Rub, it's uh, name that video part time, presented by Woodward. Now, all right, Chris, wh what's your confidence level zero through ten? I'm gonna play it safe with uh, middle of the road five. Mm, five good choices. It's decent. I like that. Yeah, kind of yeah. middle of the road. Fifty fifty odds on that. All right, uh, let's see how you do. Here we go. That's Gigi in Future Proof. No. Gigi's right. Oh, Keep going. Oh, gosh. 
correct film company. We're going to give you a win on that. We're going to give you a win because you're trying to get the hum in my head. He's riding like, uh, I can paint a picture. He's kind of riding like old, decrepit buildings with tons of snow on them and like Lee's. Neverland. Yeah. There it Boom. is. Okay. There it is. Okay. Congratulations. You got yourself a bomb Ooh, hole prize bag. Oh, goody, goody. Lucky that is me. Nice. Thank you. You loaded fellas. up with some uh, bomb hole beanies. Dang. You got a, a mug in there. You got a large oh bomb hole hoodie. Gosh. We loaded up with tons of stickers. I think there's some patches. Oh, my God. Thank you. All guys of which so are much. available at bombhole.com. Oh, and a nice little note. And a note, yep. Lovely. Thank you, fellas. Yeah, well, thank you for coming on the show. And I'm glad that you were in there. You could have not, if you didn't know that, we would have kept that. You wouldn't have got it. <laughs> Giggy would have been very upset. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. Uh, for part two of Name That Video Part, this isn't for you. This is for the listeners. I think you might know this, though. But uh, this one's for the listeners. So if you, uh, if you know this song and you're listening and you want to win a prize pack, the first person to answer it correctly gets a sticker pack from us. And the way to do that is to go on our Instagram, comment on the photo of J-Rob, uh, and that's where we pick our winner. That's where you submit your answer. So here we go. Thank you guys for playing Name That Video Part. So jumping back in, you've mentioned some amazing names, riding partners, Manuel, Bodie, et cetera. Yeah. And I wondered what you thought about, you know, I've been on trips with certain people and I knew not, I knew I needed to get out of there because they were on a level that was just something I didn't want to play with. But you're playing at this extremely high level. How important is it, do you feel like, to be with a partner that potentially at least someone to ride with or push yourself, or do you like riding alone, or what's your what's your vibe? Well, I mean, riding, like riding the resort and stuff, and I, I don't mind. I like alone's yeah. pretty fun, but yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously when you're filming, you got kind of the crew, and I've like done a few shoots where you're just the only rider, and it has its advantages, but all in all, it's like definitely you want you want the crew, at least like one other rider, one to two is kind of the the optimal number, but mm-hmm. it kind of makes it all just the whole experience. And it, it helps when, you know, you have similar enough eyes and stuff and mm-hmm. comfort levels and, but the difference enough styles where you can all kind of like find something mm-hmm. unique in your own as well. Yeah. Yeah. Is well, there anybody? Uh, go ahead, Chris. Well, no, I was just wondering, yeah, like, uh, do you feel like when you're with like, you know, we've heard the analogy of, you know, uh, Travis Rice riding with uh, Romaine, you know, in mm-hmm. that pop year. Mm-hmm. They were doing, that was when he, they hit Chad's Gap and they were just elevating, elevating, elevating. We've we've seen that. Mm-hmm. And it kind of seems like, you know, from an outsider's perspective, you and Manuel had that, I guess, like, you know, is it important for you? I'm kind of reframing that same question yeah. to, to find somebody to feed off of with that same psycho energy in a way oh for for sure it, i think it helped progress that that season um we had lucas with us too so the bar yeah, yeah so mm-hmm. the three of us like definitely pushed each other but it's funny because you mentioned uh roman that brings up a kind of a story because and that's when i kind of like realized it was it was kind of getting to a new level for me was um i went to do this line roman was with us and he was in the heli gonna come up get dropped off at the same spot and we got up there. He backed out and was like, I remember thinking like, oh my God, the gnarliest dude of like my whole childhood watching these movies doesn't even want to get out of the heli with me right now. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, what the heck, dude? But that's <laughs> yeah, crazy. Yeah. Like, is it really at that level? So we're, like, obviously someone like Manuel, if he's feeling it, like he's feeling it, you know, and. Um, so it's neat, like it is something like I remember on some of those lines and they drop all three of us off. Like I'd be here, Manuel over here and Lucas there. And like, you're all a little nervous, a little, you know, a lot going on and about to do this big line, but you're kind of, there's this camaraderie that you're all in it together. Um, so it's like almost the, it's not as scary or as intimidating because you have like some, they're not standing right with you, but like they're there with you too. They're yeah. in the same boat. Yeah. Um, which I guess could get you in trouble too, but just to rationalize, oh, well, they're doing it, so I'm doing it. But it's a really comforting feeling having mm-hmm. your boys up there, like mm-hmm. doing sure. it with you. Great stuff. 
Uh, well, I think it's good to pivot back to your snowboard career and kind of how things went. So you filmed the Transworld video, and you're doing the horse packing, and I, I just wanted to kind of see how things evolved from there. So, yeah, it really, it kind of things really kind of s- slipped off that, that after that season. Um, I feel like that Transworld project was a bit of a, like a cool down from those three big years with Absinthe. Um, but I, I think I s- uh, still kind of needed a little more time to kind of process it all. So like that next winter after that Transworld thing, I didn't really – too, it's like I couldn't really pull off the budget to do the Absinthe and all that, I felt like. And I didn't – yeah, I want to kind of step short, like try and film with them and just like my part don't stand up to my other stuff. And so it was kind of like made sense to not do that even though that was kind of my home and it felt like my place. So then I was kind of like out in the wild a little, like a, like lone wolf a little. Cause like two, I think filming in such intense, those intense projects in a tight crew and like with Hosnick, he's, he's a bit introverted already. And we're kind of like separate from the, the, the industry and what else is going on in the snowboard world. And almost intentionally, like he, he almost didn't have us like post, posting stuff like where we were and stuff, you know, so you were kind of like, so in that world away and like not going to the little, like the snowboard events and the community stuff, culture stuff. So when, then the absent thing was gone and I didn't have that routine of like staying connected with the snowboard world, it was real easy to kind of like fall off the radar pretty quick. I think, um, you know, coupled with like some pretty poor communication on my end and like being in kind of a funk and like, where do I go from here after those kind of gnarly parts? Um, but yeah, so it took a little like settling time before I was really even ready, which was really in hindsight only like a year or two. And then like, I remember the season I was working in Yosemite and I was like pretty fired up to shred that winter. I was like kind of making plans for, uh, for a project and stuff. And that's when I kind of got the call and it kind of happened pretty quick within each other. Like, None of my contracts got re-signed. And then it was like kind of a well, falling back to like reality a little like, whoa, I'm not a pro snowboarder. I'm a mule packer now. But like, you know, obviously I'm a snowboarder. But it was kind of messing my head a little bit. And then I even tried that winter to like make something happen. Didn't have any any like support from the snowboard industry, but I was like – had a little money saved from working all summer and kind of tried to like push back into it. Um, right around that same time, actually, and that's kind of the, was the fuel part of the fuel of the fire and that has kept the fire stoked all these years still was after I, I'd lost all my snowboard sponsors and Chris Wellhausen had introduced me to RP Bess at uh, ProTech. And so it was kind of ironic, like the snow, I kind of lost my snowboard sponsors and then like a skate company you know, they make snow helmets, but that they sponsored me, which is like kind of kept me, kept one toe in the door at least, kept the dream alive. Like it was a like small, it's a small budget or whatever, but it was like enough to keep me kind of like, cool, there's still like a something mm-hmm. there. And then it just kind of took, yeah. And then and obviously it wasn't enough to live off. So I had to like snap into action and find like some real work you know uh, outside of snowboarding I, I mean it seemed like I had to find it outside of snowboarding just because that was more available but maybe I could have found something inside snowboarding I don't know but so you're there you're packing so yeah just keep I just want to keep going down that road because you had a you were away from snowboarding for a few years I mean you had your toe dipped in it but you're doing commercial fishing and all this other stuff um, and I'm just kind of interested to hear about that yeah, so I guess uh, really that se- that first season after the Yosemite deal, and uh, yeah, I was like riding pretty hard, riding a bunch, and then there was just kind of the point where I like literally just kind of ran out of cash, and I was staying up at, at Alpental, which is like, it's kind of my home mountain, I got a pass there, love the place, and Snoqualmie Pass in Washington, and uh, so I just was camped out with a camper, just kind of shredding, like getting this nice storm cycle, not really worried about 
you know, knowing that the money, my bank account was like dwindling, but not really stressing it. Cause I was like, whatever, dude, I'll, it's good here. I'll figure it out. And then I remember like literally like overdrew the bank. I like, tried to buy like some snacks and the car didn't work. And I was like, dang, dude, I'm like, what am I going to do? You know, but I was still there. I had enough food for a few days and like ticket. So I was like, I don't need to go anywhere. I'll stay here. And then, man, I'm up on this like classic little run. Like you hike maybe 10 minutes. Nice vista, super fun run. You kind of take the road back to the resort. And so there's like a nice little flat spot. People kind of snack or get a sip of water. And I remember I'm eating this like super stale granola because it was like all I had. And I'm up there. And there's just like Dungeness crab shells just littered on the around the strap-in spot. And I was like, dude, somebody is living good up here, you know? Like it's not cheap. That's a, it's a you know, high-ticket item. <laughs> and uh, it can be at least. And then I get back to the truck at the end of the day and like check my phone and my buddy Greg, Greg Phillips, shout out Greg, like um, low key. He kind of became my, uh, what, did, what did he call him? He's my transition coach. So he was the one super sick ripper, lives up at Alpental. He's dating Mary Rand now. But um, he kind of gave me some guidance, was like my transition coach out of, La La Land of a professional snowboarder, like help me get <laughs> fall back into the reality with the re with everyone, you know. So it was like, so I called him to thank him for the, um, yeah. I see, called him back. I was, he's like left me a text like, yo, I saw your camper. I left you some crab in the fridge, and I was like, oh, duh, that was his crab because he actually the one who showed me those runs too the year before. So <laughs> it was like, called him to thank him for the crab. Ate good that night, but I was like. He's like, so what are you doing? I was like, man, I don't know, bro. Like, I'm going to go get a look for a job. And, like, so my lady, she'd moved out to Port Townsend because her sister was there. And so I was like, I didn't know what to do if I was going to go back to Montana or what. And then I ended up, yeah, was going to go back, um, stay with her. And he's like, so, yeah, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm out of money. I'm going to look for a job. Like, dude, something mellow. Like, I'm so over the – the high stress, high <laughs> pace, you know, like, you know, it's like work at a health food store or stock shelves or something chill. Cause, and I like to eat good food and have connected into that sort of world is pretty cool. Um, so that was kind of the, what I was thinking. He's like, well, it's not a health food store, but, um, you know, we've been going out crabbing on the coast, one man shy. If you want to join the crew, I'm like commercial fishing boat like crabbing and i'm just like thinking the deadliest catch and all this stuff and i'm like oh my god i don't know exactly what i was had in mind but he's like yeah money's pretty good and i was like all right let me think about it i like look into it a little bit i call him back and i was like dude i'll do it like game on let's let's do it so i meet them out there in westport washington a couple days later and we go out and it's just like, I didn't even know. I was like, so what do I bring? Like a headlamp? Like, what do I need? He's like, no, dude. It's like, obviously there's like huge lights, you know, this is like a full commercial operation. Um, I didn't know what to expect. It was my first time on a boat that big other than like a state ferry or something. And um, man, it was psycho. Cause it was, we went out at night, it's like 15 foot swell, like 15 second periods. It was just these crazy troughs. It was my first time on a boat like that. First time doing any of the work. So I'm like learning what I'm doing. I'm just puking, puking cons like every few minutes. Just kept plugging, dude. And, you know, we ended up turning in because it was so gnarly out. Like we couldn't, I was too bad to actually like run the crab gear safely. So like we went out, came back the next day and it was like way more chill. But that first one was, was 15 psycho. 15 foot swells, though, you said? Yeah. So Wat scary. I water on the deck all the time. Oh, so yeah. Splashing over huge. Yeah. Cold ass Northwest too. Like and I remember picturing, yeah, it's winter, it's February, and well, it's 35 degrees, you know, uh. and raining. And, um, man, I remember thinking, too, afterwards, I was like, dude, like, if you fell off the boat in that situation, because that's the thing, there's like, just don't fall off. Yeah. It's not an option. You're wearing waders, you just go straight yeah. down. Yeah, that's crazy. So yeah. that was that was kind of a reality check, and that was it took a lot to sit with, because I think I could rationalize the risks I was taking in snowboarding, because... I fucking love it, you know, and this is my life and my passion. But then when you're like <laughs> in the workforce as doing something that's just a job for money and not, you have no vested interest in it beyond that, 
and you're risking your life, that was like, it didn't sit super well with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you, you went on to become a fisherman, right? Uh, but I stopped, but yeah, I mean, crabbing. you know, I stuck with it. I did it. I went pretty much full-time commercial fisherman for two years. So I did the, I started that like end tail end of that, that season in on the Washington coast crabbing. And then I did well enough that they were, the skipper was stoked. He invited me to work up in Southeast Alaska doing the salmon fishing and did that for two seasons. And then I did a whole full winter season doing the, the crab West coast crab. And it's crazy. Cause you're out there the first two weeks. It's like, boom, boom. Like you don't stop. And we were on like 12 hours on four hours off for two weeks Damn. straight, you know? So you're just like, a Gnarly. zombie but zero you're just, mindset just yeah you're like survive. so strong because you're just lifting these things and you're barely eating so you're just like kind of lean mean literally mean lean in a fighting machine it's like <laughs> now one scrabbers are gnarly you're you're going full winter no snowboarding i'm guessing crabbing uh are you on the boat are you like are you still like i'm a fucking snowboarder or are you like i'm i'm a fisherman no, you see the mountains off there, and you're like, oh. And you know every time it's pouring rain down there, it's dumping in the mountains, so you're just, like, so <laughs> bummed. But, no, like, it was I, – I, I definitely felt like a snowboarder still, not a pro snowboarder, but um, definitely a snowboarder. And actually, like, through all that, that was kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. Like, I'd already um, lined up a trip with um, Jesse Grankowski at Air Blaster doing this thing to Japan – to Rishri, which we ended up being like Austin Sweeten and Lucy and then mm. and Griffin. Sick. And um, so we had a pretty sick crew, Endo. Who, um, and then that was like at the end of that season. I actually got to leave. I already told the skipper. I was like, in March 1st, I'm going to Japan, you know. And like a few days before, I'm like, yeah, I'm leaving to Japan in a couple of days. He's like, oh, dang, I didn't realize. So I was like, Dude, I'm out, you know. So I'm out there and I'd see like the homies would like, Post and stuff. It's just the weather's just so crappy out there, and I'm like <laughs> out on this like beautiful snowboard adventure, like in this amazing place. And yeah, so that kind of like kept me kept me motivated and tied to like not wanting to give it give up on it. How did it feel once you got to Japan? You're with the crew. I mean, you're coming off the boat, super strong. Well, the first I mean, appreciation or what? What what was the feeling? Definitely a very like the the whole kind of culture shock, and I was definitely super grateful of the whole experience. But like the first few days, first two days were super rough actually, because I'm with these you know elite snowboarders mm-hmm. have been snowboarding all season, and I hadn't snowboarded in like two months or yeah. three months or whatever. And so those first couple of days were pretty rough, like keeping up and mm-hmm. like you know didn't bring enough water, like just kind of out of the routine. You don't all these little things that mm-hmm. are just instinct once you're when you're doing it, like just. So I was actually got pretty sick the first couple of days, but then good night's rest, couple of days acclimating, and like day three, I was kind of like you know I'm not about leading the charge, but I was like back up there in. and we summited that mountain, which was insane. Like rode it all the way down, like. Three four thousand feet down to sea level. Wow, it was such a dreamy experience. Yeah, uh, we got a guest question from none other, no other than Shane Charlebois. Yo, J Rob, it's Shane Charlebois. <laughs> got a question for you. Please elaborate the lizard tamer situation. <laughs> 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 oh, Shane, thanks, man. Uh, thanks for letting me crash at your house too while I'm here, <laughs> and for going out and working so hard to help get these clips and have that good vibe out there goes a long way, bro. Thank you. Um, yeah, the lizard tamer. Um, <laughs> well, that's a funny one, you know, cause that was the thing when those years I was going to Haynes, like I didn't ever want to leave early. I was always the last one there and it would end after the heli thing. Most people are going home. We're getting the sleds ready, renting sleds, going out on Haynes pass, just squeezing every drip of juice out of it. We can, Cause the worst thing at the end of the season is like, wish you'd have done a little more, right? Like I did so like strived for that. So yeah, we did, we're out there in Haynes pass, you know, make it, we had this like built a step up jump, Coker, Cocard and I are hitting it. And, um, man did this, I was trying like front 10 doubles, which is still like this thing that is like eluding me. I've gotten so dang close on this trick so many times. Bodhi said I need to just grab mute instead of melon, which mm-hmm. is what I normally am trying to grab, but. 
I just liked how Mueller did it with the melon. It's just like I'm trying like to it emulate just work that. For you. But your fr- the way you do your cork front sevens, it seems like it should just work. Yeah, so I've been so close, but I'll, I'll like land it on my feet, but then I'll catch or whatever. On this particular one, I was like overspun and under flipped. So I can't, and it's spring snow. So I just came in and just <laughs> toe edge, like full whipper, like scorpion, like things fly off. <laughs> Um, there's a quick clip of the shot in that part ever since just me. I do like a front seven on the same thing. It's just was the warm up trick. Kind of wish it hadn't have been in the part, but then they show the slam of that one afterwards. And yeah, I just like grab my stuff. And like every time I've had a concussion, I don't know about you, Chris, or you, Mikey, like, I know you guys have had them, but like, do you get deja vu? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Really bad. Okay. So like every time I've ever hit my head, I get this extreme deja vu, like mm-hmm. this thing, these people, this has all happened before. Yep. And I got the same thing there. However, this time there was like, and it wasn't like physically there in the snow, like a hallucination, but there was this being and there was a man with an army of lizards behind him. And so I'm up there grabbing my gear about to like ride down. I'm like kind of shaking my head like, whoa, you know, like where'd the lizard tamer come from? (laughs) Or like how'd the lizard tamer get here? (laughs) And they're like looking at me like and I ride down to Shane with like, you know, <laughs> tail between my legs. And I'm just like, where'd the lizard tamer go? And they're just like, oh, God, dude. <laughs> homie is cl- like cuckoo, dude. We really need to get him to the hospital or something. But no, then I like, kind of was just normal. But like it was so clear there was, was something that in the concussion broke down or whatever, like my sort of perception kind of open that window or that the curtains a little more to like see a little more of the magic I think out yeah. there because it was crazy it was like I knew this guy and his lizards were like like family or something what, um, what was he wearing what did he look like you know it was he was it was pretty simple like simple simple garb like kind of classic I guess seem not about a robe but I, I yeah it's a little unclear but it was pretty simple like his outfit didn't isn't what stood out it was yeah. definitely like his his army lizard of minions yeah so you think he maybe like peeled the veil back to another you know misty dimension that we don't know about with that so a little a little bit and then why i say that following up because that following season i did an avalanche course like an abbey two like caa level two and with this amazing guy, Bruce, I forget his last name, but um, we did the course in Squamish, stayed in this little hut, and through the whole thing, you know, the nights were staying in the hut. Over dinner, we're just kind of like BSing, like, oh, what do we do in the summer? Do in the summer? What do you do? Kind of like, what other things are you interested in? And he was like, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm also a guide in the summer. I'm like, oh yeah, like a climbing guide, you know, like backcountry guide. And he's like, no, I'm a spirit guide. I was like, whoa, dude, spirit guide, huh? And then so what he would do was guide these, I guess, clients, because they essentially would charge for it as a business, but traditionally it's not necessarily. But um, they would help people prepare and execute these vision fasts. And he explained, and then I, I, I was like, whoa, and I told him this story about the concussion and the lizard tamer, and he was like, yeah, it's really similar thing that we're inducing through essentially starving yourself. Same sort of thing with psychedelic experience can also be achieved, like reached with a concussion. Mm-hmm. So mm. it was like, whoa. Yeah. And yeah, so then that that really sparked a fascination with this, with going further into this and this vision fast kind of idea and this concept and he gave me the whole printout on how to do it and prepare it and execute it and everything and I never did it myself but then there's a, that's another story where my friend Donald comes in mm-hmm. um, my chiropractic sponsor and um, he he kind of introduced he brought he introduced me into that stuff like for real um, we actually hang tight we have a we have a patreon question. So I want to plug our Patreon mm-hmm. members because they uh, they support the show. Um, so the subscription based platform where you, know, you get to support us, which is really really helpful in us being able to do this show. And you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes, and then you get to kind of figure out. A lot of times we record 
way early, four, six weeks before the episode comes out. So you get to know who's recording, and then you get to submit a question, and you get some stuff for mm-hmm. signing up. So anyway, just want to say thank you to our Patreon members. But we have a question from Jason Stoked, who's a Patreon member. He says, yo, Jay Rizzy, Jason Stoked here. I heard you went on some cool Native American spirit quest adventure with our chiropractic shred homie, Master Mini Donald, Don Donald. How was that adventure? So that's what he's talking about. Yeah, right? yeah. Jason, thanks, bro. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I wanted to bring this up in some way, so I'm glad you you kind of pushed it there. But um, yeah, so I, um, really the trip was incredible. And I should probably start a little bit with, with Donald meeting Donald and it was just he just reached out to me the DM mm. on the Instagram like hey I see you're snowboarding a lot I want to like help help you out in some way and it was like kind of a sponsorship deal and I called him and he immediately um we just clicked on the phone and he started talking about this vision fast and it's a Lakota ceremony called Hamblecha um and I was instantly like well like I've already been kind of obsessed with this idea and wanting to go further into it. And I'm like, was trying to push back into snowboarding and like, you're the first guy to reach out and say, Hey, I want to help you reach your goals and, and do this. And also to have that whole counterpart. And it's like, so the things that drew him to me or, and me to him are just, you know, kind of another, like on otherworldly almost, you know, um, definitely some, some magic there. And yeah. So this last summer we went out it was like a month trip and we started preparing because i was rehabbing this a knee all last winter i wasn't even snowboarding and i was healing more than my body in that time and that's when we to prepare for these ceremonies a big part of it is the sweat lodge Mm. so we started doing sweat lodge i went with him for my first one this property that i've have access to we built a sweat lodge out there and he was coming here and we did a lot of sweats and for anyone who hasn't done it and has the opportunity it's it's really a powerful experience and you go in with an open mind open heart i mean you're you're gonna come out better than you went in i feel um definitely a lot of healing powers to these Explain exactly what they are because i'm not entirely sure well so sweat lodge it's quite simple and it's like the whole idea of it, um, but the ceremonial side adds adds a bit more intricacies. But essentially, it's made with like a willow, young willow tree, and you fold them and make like it looks like a little igloo kind of hut, like a upside down basket, and cover it like I'm sure traditionally it was like buffalo robes and stuff, but like you cover it with blankets, whatever, and there's a little pit inside, and all the thing, all the directions, all the orientation, all it's all very ceremonial and very kind of. I mean, different tribes and different people do it different ways, but there's like some kind of structure to it. And then, so inside is where you would put the hot rocks, and then outside is kind of the there's like the gateway from inside to out, and there's you have your fire pit, which, and then that's where the stones you call them grandpas, grandmas, they are heated essentially red hot and then brought in usually like seven at a time or like do multiple rounds, but you put them in the, into the sweat lodge. Everyone's kind of sitting around in a circle. Um, the leaders singing and drumming and and you close it up. It's dark, it's hot. And it kind of breaks you down a little bit to your like a little more, I don't know, raw, raw self, I think. Cause, um, yeah, and you know, you're connecting with I guess ancestors, you're connecting with creator, with the nature, all through these songs, and essentially the steam carries your prayers up. And yeah, some you know, I experienced some had some really huge benefits from it and yeah, people have been healed of of things for, through these ceremonies, you know, like um that date back so long you know so that's kind of the start of all that um and how i got into it mike you've done some of those as well right yeah i've done a couple sweats cool and they're amazing i mean it's like you were saying that heat for me at least it broke me down where that's all you could focus on was literally breathing and totally luckily there's a 
leader there. You know, usually I've done the north, south, east, west, kind of, you know, saying yeah. thank you and all those things. A lot yeah. of gratitude comes up. Yes. And it re you really get broken down to your basic level. Yeah. yeah. We're not talking about like uh, sauna at Gold's Gym here. Like I mean, we sauna at your house, and this is this is that, and then maybe an hour longer. Maybe, so it's know. it's suffer fest. It's not like a it's not like a comfortable experience. It's not comfortable, but I wouldn't call it suffering yeah. because you're really kind of also being led in Bobby. Yeah, and you're really like, you know, sending out prayers or gratitude or, you know, even you know, being introduced to different natural elements that kind of true bring up a lot. What else in your healing journey? So you're talking about your chiropractic healing your mind and your body. Um, you kind of dove in. Is it in anything besides just the sweat lodge? Well, yeah. So the sweat lodge um, led to the ceremony, Lakota ceremony called Humblecha. And that was the, essentially, their tra the translation is crying for a vision. And it's essentially a vision fast. Um, but it's all based around the sweat lodge. And we went to this um, extremely sacred spot in South Dakota where you know, people like Crazy Horse and stuff did their humblechas there. Um, Fool's Crow. Like these people, these like really legendary healers and medicine men, I guess, in these tribes come to this place. Uh, it's a sac you know, sacred site for the healing, for the power, and for the, like, for the lessons. And, yeah, so you, you prep for it. You do a few sweats, kind of get into it, and you pick, like, how long you want to go up for. And... I picked the max. I went, I was going to like go for three days. And so you go up there, no food, no water. And it's all very like kind of ceremonial thing, how they, they call them putting you on the hill. And there's songs and a whole kind of prayer ties and a whole kind of ceremony behind it. Um, but the idea is that you go out there with nothing, essentially, and just endure and pray and... There's some pretty powerful stories and like, I mean, mine isn't, I won't go into too much like my own experience of what I saw and things there, but like, wasn't, didn't like shatter my whole window open, but it was definitely cracked it a little wider into that world. And like, wow, the, the magic out there is, is real and it's tangible. And if you're looking for it and open to it, it's all around us, mm -hmm. you know, especially when you get out of the cities and stuff, you know, it's more easy to tap into. But. Mm -hmm. It's really well articulated uh, way of of articulating stuff that's hard to explain right there. I like how you said that, like cool. uh, cracking your window open to tap into the magic that's out there. Mm -hmm. It's it's you know, it's so interesting to me. We interview so many people, right? <clears throat> yeah. And everybody's got different takes and everybody's got different worldly views and spiritual and religious and all those things but like you know what you what you're talking about tapping into what may some people may call god some people may call universal consciousness some yeah. people may call you know nature some people may call it a wide array of things but like i think about like one person who is who is like the people that are really like you know, open and they're not, they're not sh closed off to it. They're open to these like deeper experiences. Uh, you know, you have Travis Rice who talked about it very openly. Yeah. You have Jamie Anderson who talked about it very openly. Mm -hmm. Those two arguably could be, you know, generationally some of the greatest of all time. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have Jamie Lynn. You, and, and so I guess I, I find it interesting to like, I, I put yourself and what you've accomplished on your snowboarding, like as dude, you've done some, like really really unbelievable things on your snowboard so i just love listening to you talk about cracking open that door to this magic that we isn't tangible that you can't see and and some people are going to roll their eyes at it which is awesome That's fair totally fine but yeah. i also like the that some are open to these experiences as well well too and i think like you mentioned travis and jamie and i mean it's these they've had some really powerful experiences even just like with their snowboarding right and like that i think i don't want to call it like a like a shortcut but it's kind of if you're at that level and you're pushing it that hard 
you're kind of tapped into something that most people might not even know exists or don't aren't tapped into at least. And for those two, especially like, I mean, they're spiritual people and they're some of the most talented athletes of all time. And I don't think that's a coincidence necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think like they've probably through their snowboarding kind of has shaped their view. Like, Whoa, anything is possible. And what you see, you know, there's more than what you see. And it's probably pushed them down that road, you know, and like, that's how I feel like it's kind of opened that idea to me. It was just like, kind of on this this edge and it's like you kind of get a little more of a glimpse i think mm -hmm. you don't want to cross it mm -hmm. the edge but you, you know l listening to you talk too is i also hear you know J i hear a lot of jamie lynn you know when the way he was explaining you guys have a uh kind of the what he the way he would describe it is the power of suggestion where he mm. was mentioning like you know we go on this road trip and then kind of like we have no plan for two weeks and then we go here and then we end up here and these kind of like hmm. like I guess the way I would I would articulate it as like you know there's a kind of a flow of the world right like there's like it's like a river and you kind of can like get in that flow and it takes you where you need to go and then like oftentimes I'm swimming fucking upstream in the river <laughs> and I'm like why is nothing fucking working it's because like you're, you're going against the flow and whatever whatever I'm guess I'm getting yeah. we're getting deep like and crunchy that. but I like listening to you talk about getting on these trains and, you know, how one thing led to another, led to another, how, you know, you're snowboarding bell to bell and then you win Baker banked and then you get an absinthe and it's like you get, you've gotten into this like, like flow of this, of life that, that, um, it, through maybe the power of suggestion or kind of letting go and being okay with what happens and not trying to control it or something. I'm just kind of blabbering, but maybe no, you can thanks, elaborate Chris. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think there's some truth to that and, and that's definitely, you know, yeah, when, when you, when things start going well and they just kind of keep going and it's like, whoa, and you're just open to it. And then it is a pretty wild feeling like where it can take you. Um, and then when they, things aren't going that well and you kind of like are still open, it's like kind of brings you back or, you know, kind of sets you on the course one way or another. Mm hmm Interesting stuff to talk about. Mike, do you have anything to add? I mean, it, rem it reminds me of the story earlier with, you know, everybody went to bed and you decided to talk to two women, which led to, you know, you're out of trouble. Yeah. Just kind of being, letting curiosity over fear win, you know? Yeah. And, and I can, I was kind of consciously living like that. Um, and I think it has brought so many amazing experiences and lessons um, some harder than others, like some of the, you know, some of the lessons were pretty hard. Like one particular where I, um, yeah, I think I, I got a little carried away with that whole going with the flow mm -hmm. idea and saying yes, just kind of to yeah. new things, yeah. um, and just let the kind of universe guide you. Mm -hmm. I think in most situations, that's a good way to live, but there's probably, maybe some things to kind of leave off the table. Yeah. But unless you set those parameters ahead of time, you know, which does seem kind of limiting and like literally limiting in some ways, but um, maybe a healthier approach. But in hindsight, I don't regret it. You know, I don't regret any of those things. And like, yeah, like, I mean, there was that one time, you know, when I picked up that hitchhiker and he asked if I wanted to do meth with him mm -hmm. and I, had, which I had never done it before or after and was like kind of just went with it and you know now in hindsight it's like even now saying this I don't it was part of my path and what I've learned so much through that and it's set me on a different course um which is inevitably uh, led back to snowboarding so it's like really like I wouldn't even trade that. So I guess I shouldn't say to not to limit yourself, but like, you know, maybe. I, th I think for the sake of like comedy and good storytelling, maybe like lean into this mess story because it's a fucking good one, dude. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Mind you, I was coming off of an extreme high. Um, I had just did a two week um, video shoot with Sweetgrass Productions. Um, all nighttime in a thousand watt light suit. That for that movie was incredible. And they it went to this 
movie out of Hong Kong, um, an action movie called Europe Raiders. Mm. That's like who contracted them to mm. do it. And they picked myself and this local Nelson writer, Adrian Buck, super ripper up there. And uh, dude, we spent like 10 days shooting at Golden Alpine Holidays. Like we'd start shooting at like eight at night or like 10 at night. You know, you just shoot till the sun was coming up pretty much. And um, yeah, so this really crazy experience. Did my first double backflip in a thousand watt light suit um, <laughs> at 4 a.m. Last try, because they were like, this is it. The camera's like such a production. There's like 20 people in this crew. But so just this unreal experience through that. I remember landing that backflip, double backflip was like, I, I could call it a career. And that was pretty much like the icing on the cake right there. <laughs> and um, yeah, but no. So after that trip, I was driving to meet up with Shane and the Absinthe guys down in Tahoe. And I remember like, I see this billboard. It's so stupid, like thinking back. And I'm like, it's like, you know, driving through the countryside up there's a lot of like anti-meth billboards and anti-drug awareness and stuff like that. And um, it's like meth, not even once. Like I had this conscious huh. thought like, well, once, like I think the problem is like you get hooked and you do it and you throw your life away. Like if you literally do it once, what's the harm, you know? And then <laughs> so – Literally a few hours later, I'm in like Winnemucca or whatever, and this dude's like, "Hey man, like, can you give me a ride to Reno?" I'm like, "Sure, I'm going through Reno," and, dude, and that was the thing. The whole time he was like, he's like, "Oh, he's like, at first he's like, man, I can't wait to get to Reno, smoke a bowl." I'm like, "Dude, I'm like, I got a little cannabis if you need." He's like, "No, that's not what I'm talking about." I'm like, "Oh," so he like wasn't talking about that, and then he started explaining it more, and then I was like, "Oh, this guy is into meth." This is a meth guy. <laughs> I should have picked up the signs by that point, like honestly, you know. But like, um, it's I'm a, it was a little slow to the, slow to that one. But then he's like, "Yeah, man, like it's such a huge help you driving me out there. Like, dude, I love to pay you back and like smoke you out or whatever." I was like, "Oh God!" I was like, I thought about it, and I was like, "Yeah, okay, I'll try it." And yeah, sure. Power, power suggestion, going with it. Yeah, so then it's, it's, it got just got weirder from there. And then we're, like, in the Sparks, like, storage units, like, trying to find this guy who, like, looks like Santa Claus. Like, they sell the drugs out of the storage unit. And I'm just, like, in this whole underworld that I've never seen before. I'm just, like, dove right in there. It's like, this is insane, dude. And then, like, we go to this other guy. This is, like, it was just such a crazy, crazy night. And then, yeah, that was even before it actually – that whole experience happened. Like, you know, he's like a vet. I've never done it before. I like, try it. And I remember we're like chilling in this like weird park. Like it's above the, it's like the biggest trailer park in the country, I think by mm. outside of Reno. Um, oh, sun, sunny side, something. I forget the name. We're like up here and it's like, tr listen to Devin, the dude. I remember so clearly and try it. And like, dude, for like 20 minutes, it felt amazing like i felt really good and then it i started feeling sick like it started with just like stomach ache kind of sweaty and i was like puking diarrhea vomiting sweating profusely and like it was so crazy i didn't know what to do meanwhile i'm like i'm kind of tripping out like it's all kind of surreal i'm definitely elevated and then like we just check into this hotel just a spot to chill and, like, I remember almost, like, feeling so sick. Like, my head is, like, insane. My, I'm, like, puking. I've got the bucket, I'm like, on the bed, just, like, in pain. Like, ugh. But, like, every once in a while, there'd just be this, like, wave of, like, euphoria. Because, like, I was still obviously high. But, like, I was having a crazy reaction. And the whole time, he was still, he was like, oh, it's, it's all right. You'll be all right. First, he was even like, I think you just need more. I was like, I don't think so, man. <laughs> like, I think that's the problem. That's what got me in this situation. I don't think, like... It's going to get me out of it also. <laughs> and then so it was like, and then I saw the sign. Not Well, but then, yeah, it was like so crazy because I'm there sick. He's in, he's got my phone for some reason. He's like in the, the bathroom smoking meth, watching porn on my phone somehow, pulled this up. He's chilling in there. I'm like, for, like losing it. And then I'm like, I'm still okay with it all. It's like not too far past my comfort level until like my heart starts doing this really crazy beating pattern and it's just like boom boom and then you're like 
I'm like, oh, it's like I could almost see it like beating out of my chest, dude. I'm like, eh, like, oh my God. So like, I still have this, I think I have the snowmobile in the back of the truck. Drive to the freaking Sparks Hospital. Drove yourself. Drove myself. He was in the car with me, but like he didn't want to drive either. Drove there, just explained the whole thing, told him what was up, what I did. They got me all hooked in, hooked up, the whole thing. Like, and like they, st- there was a point where they're all kind of like panicking a little, because I was like, I think I'm good. Like, you guys can just let me go. I'll, I'll be all right. They're like, well, you have this thing like with the whatever cardiologist, whatever's worried, and it's called a, because there was I forget the name of the, it's like an enzyme that was like in. It's when your heart gets damaged, your body produces this enzyme and the levels weren't dropping yet. Mm-hmm. So they were like, we got to keep you overnight and do more tests. Like, and I remember even calling Lanning, Andrew, he was like Justin, one of Justin's partners with Absinthe. So he was like a doctor and I called him and was like, this is what they're telling me. Should I stay? Or should I go? And he's like, dude, this isn't something to mess with. Like stay there. And I was like, dude, it's going to be so expensive. Like, I don't know. He's like, dude, whatever it's going to be all right. Like, yeah. So I stayed the night there and did the whole thing. Like it's called a vasospasm, I guess. It's like some sort of cardiac kind of event. Like it's not like a heart attack, but it's like definitely like overstressing your, your system and your heart. And two, I think like, so a lot of, like a lot of the, the people, the real open people that, um, the more spiritual people, always tell me I have a big like a lot of heart and so it was kind of a crazy feeling to like I don't know if it was ironic or kind of coincidental it's like this is damaging I damaged it and yeah I mean after that it was like pretty hard to like I I kind of there was a big shift there after that too because even then like I was still I recovered for a few days and like the crew was still in Tahoe, like filming, but I was just like, I don't think I'm, I'm up to it. Like I was convinced that snowboarding and the risks that I've taken and the tolerance for risk that I'd built through snowboarding had overflowed into my off snow life to a point where it was unsafe. Mm. Um, and I was convinced in my head that I had to quit kind of quit snowboarding almost, or at least chill out to not, be so loose and like off snow as well. Cause mm-hmm. it would just carry over like, um, which now I am so grateful and thankful. Like that's what I needed was this base, this foundation that I've been, that I've built with Sierra and Opal. Um, I call her my daughter. She's technically my stepdaughter, but we've been raising her together for over six years now. She turns eight this spring. Mm-hmm. And so that, that sort of that kind of home base and that feeling um, that I achieved, like building with them, I think is what is really what I was kind of lacking. Cause like the season would end and it'd be like, Oh, what next? It was so crazy. And it's like, a lot of guys are like, Oh, I can't wait to get home to the family, you know? And then like go into that season, Mm -hmm. you know, family time now. And like, I was like, what's next? Like, Oh, this is shiny. That's shiny. That sounds exciting. And I just kind of think it went a little, Flew a little close to the sun, as they say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. That's a good thing to keep on too. Thinking about, you know, the the highs that you've experienced in snowboarding. I'll I'll never experience. Most civilian snowboarders will never experience of riding Alaska and riding lines and trying the scariest shit possible and landing and being a hero and just like these kind of like just unbelievable highs. You know. Uh, and yeah. and it seems like that you, you take that same approach to life and to partying and it, and it's at the essentially like what goes up must come down at some point too true right exactly. so i'm sure you did you experience like with those extreme highs came extreme lows oh for sure i think there's definitely like you know every season coming off a heavy film season there's like a few a few weeks at least of kind of like you're pretty down and and kind of trying to get back in a groove and that definitely elevated when I started doing the heli stuff. Cause it was even more intense and more dangerous and like you're in an even tighter crew. And now 
you have this like crazy machine, like this helicopter and these like, there's, there's all these dangers and all this stuff. Like you're on such high alert and such a crazy thing. Like, you know, I've never fought in a war or anything like that. However, that's probably the closest I will ever come to that experience. And I don't want to belittle that, that experience because I don't wish that on anyone. However, that's all I could think of like a, kind of a small dose of that kind of feeling with the kind of PTSD sort of thing. And you come back and you're not with that crew anymore and those people and no one can really relate to what you've done. And it's like hard to talk about. Like you either sound like arrogant or kind of like just so off base that it's like hard to even bring up, you know, and like people are like, how was it? You're like, where do I begin? Just <laughs> mind blown. I don't know. It's mm -hmm. insane. Yeah. It, I mean, not again, like not diminishing combat, but when you talk about going to Alaska <clears throat> and pulling Bodhi out of a hole, you know, blue in the face, sounds pretty similar to combat to me in some ways, you know, too. Like things like that, There's like the, the adrenaline being that high and the camaraderie with your comrades, you know, like when you're on top of a line with Manuel and you two are the two bad motherfuckers that are about to drop in on something like that. There's some camaraderie built there that, that is, is not to be diminished. I think too. Yeah, I agree for sure. That's a cool point. I like that. Mm -hmm. Well, we were just talking about crystal meth now. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> what I was wondering is, have you tried run through wall smelling salts? Ooh. Cause it's, it's like they're almost stronger actually. <laughs> what I'm told. Oh no. <clears throat> should, should we get like the, doctor just in case yeah, something we, happens yeah we have should. him on standby if you got a big heart you might we might need to get uh there's a toilet around yeah, the corner i can get a bucket going <laughs> if you start puking. <laughs> okay okay <laughs> we're running low so i'm just gonna, let's can split, i borrow your phone let's split one Mikey. by the way before we hit this <laughs> my phone yeah i want to borrow it in case i want to you need to go you need to go to the bathroom <laughs> yeah bad job <laughs> oh i missed it oh yeah god i now i get it. it to me after okay. <laughs> so you, you squeeze it and you give it a whiff these are run through wall smelling salts they'll wake okay. you up they're uh Available at bombhole.com. We're probably sold out. At I'm this familiar. Point. It's my first time trying it. Of you course. snap it in the middle with your fingers. I mean, are you comfortable with this? I don't yeah, want to yeah, peer it, pressure you. you it's, know? Mike hit it's one. Alcohol, he already popped it. I'll pop it. And then you no. just give it a. No, it's ammonia. You give it a little shot. Oh! It's a strong batch. Oh my God. It's good. So I've smelt that before, actually. <coughs> After okay. a concussion? No, um. So in my in my um, time working with the Dungeness crab, because oh. mm. they produce ammonia as a waste. Oh really? Yeah. So if like you just left a crab in a bucket for too long, it would start to smell like that. And we could start making our own run through wall yeah. smelling salts and call them crab crab flavor. Oh, and much worse because it would also rot. But it's like there's like an ammonia smell mm. to them. So did that give you a little like flashback to crabbing or what? Maybe. Flashback to something super familiar. I wanted to say one thing before we forget. Uh, yeah, Chris. We have a we have a signed print of you shot by Andy Wright. Oh, sick! And uh, if you're down to sign it, we haven't asked you. Yeah, of course. And so Andy uh, provides us these photos, which is really nice of him. And so, um, you know, he actually started his own print shop called AndyWrightPhoto.com. And he's got all kinds of prints on there of iconic imagery. He's shot lots of Mikey. Mikey's got a cover with him, right? Yes, sir. And his uh, his website's andyrightphoto.com. And if you use promo code JROB, J-R-O-B, all capital, you get 20% off the week that this episode comes out. And, uh, you know, he's getting his print shop up and running. So um, he, and he's hooking us up. So be sure to support Andy. Um, and then we, have, we also have the print of J-ROB signed on our site as well. So... Um, always trying to. Andy was dominant for a long time. One of the goats of snowboard mm -hmm. photography, for sure. Yep. Amazing guy, too. Yeah. yeah. Great. Good stuff. All right. So, going back to what we were just talking about um, with unwinding from a season, I heard that when you guys did Absinthe, you guys used to go to Costa Rica mm -hmm. and do a surf trip. Mm -hmm. And I heard that you maybe got carried away or stung, stuck around, or you got a story associated with that. Well, one one season it was the heavy mental um, year. It was my second year with Absinthe, and yeah, the crew like I think they used to go to Hawaii to kind of like be somewhere rad where you can surf to edit the movie, and they chose um, Costa Rica because Justin had a friend from Nelson that was living down there, so we kind of went to his zone, and yeah, like the crew 
it was like a two week trip for the crew. And I was just like, you know, I'm just going to book it for two months instead. And then, cause that was like that summer after my whole Nicaragua trip fell through. And I remember like talking with like Blair kind of explained, he's like, dude, if you want to learn to surf, just go somewhere and surf for a month straight, like somewhere warm, tropical. So that was my idea with that Nicaragua thing. It fell through the year before. So I was like jumped all over this Costa Rica thing. And so, yeah, I was so sick because the first two weeks of the um, the trip, it was the crew was there. So I had like some homies kind of like orient myself in the area. We are kind of learning the zone, working on like editing, a, you know, a bit, surfing a bit more probably. And then, yeah, the crew left and I just like stuck around. It was just like, like does the... I guess like squatting rule laws in Costa Rica are pretty loose. Like it's like 50 meters from like high tide line is like public land or there's like some exceptions, I think, but like, so you can just camp like just off the beach, you know, like it's not a big deal. And, um, so I was just kind of, and they were all kind of in like cabanas or whatever. And I was like, dude, I'm just going to camp. Like uh, it's nice and it's free and we will just do that. Um, yeah. So I camped out on the beach for like, a month and then eventually Justin's buddy Koji like invited me to like stay at his place and kind of house sit a little bit it was just such a crazy experience man I got like so many days surfing I'd never really surfed and it was like all clicking I was having so much fun like just eating super well like good food down there and yeah and that's when it ended up the crazy th I think where he's talking about there's a crazy story um you're kind of alluding to is like I fell on the rocks coming out one day and like jack my hand so I like just left the beach so I wouldn't be tempted to like surf prematurely before it had healed and I ended up meeting this kid in the first town um first main town and we kind of hit it off like he spoke enough English and I spoke just enough Spanish we could kind of like homie up a little crew up and dude he ended up taking me on this crazy um trek through the jungle and like we spent like two like three days two nights like in this thick Costa Rica jungle. Where were you guys going? Like, where, what's the purpose of this trek? <sighs> just a, just a, I don't know, why white people a, trek. I don't know. White people like, trek. Or, no, why? Not white people. Like, why do people trek? Oh, why? I don't okay. know. You're just the going same, on adventures. It, yeah, you, exactly. You're just going like, on, like, a hiking trip. He would guide, like, tourists on trips through this wilderness. And it's like a it's like a national park, Corcovada National it. Park. It's gorgeous. It's okay. unreal. Yep. Um, so, yeah, we, like hike in from the one side and we're going to like hike through and take like a bus back or whatever. That's kind of the plan. And man, we're like walking the, we're still on like a gravel road before we even get to the trail. We're meeting all his different friends along the way. There's like these gold miners. They got this little tarp, black tarp plastic house shack right on the river, like miners. And, um, dude, we're having coffee with these guys. And the one dude's like, Oh, freaks out. He's like, there's the fair to land snake. That's like, Torsiapella, they call it. It's like a super venomous snake local to the area. And like, I don't know, four or five hours without the anti-venom and things are getting really bad for you. And so this, we're in this little tarp house. There's like no real walls, you know? And there's like this snake. It's right next to the dude's foot, right next to the guy's foot. This snake strikes this frog and he sees it happen. He starts bludgeoning the um, snake with the back, the blunt end of the massage or uh, massage um, machete, machete. Um, so because if they, you cut them in half they can still bite you so you like bludgeon them and in the like 20 seconds it took him to like knock this thing down dude that frog had swollen up like four or five times its size like wow. a puff ball wow. <laughs> and then here we are you know this dude has been so light hearted this whole time and then we're like we leave that experience and we're about to head into the jungle I'm in like he's in legit crocs I'm in like these little ankle shoes, like barely any support, definitely no like protection from a snake bite, which <laughs> the, I asked him, are we going to see anyone? He's like, dude, the only people we'll see are the local gold miners, you know? And sure enough, the people we saw had knee high rubber boots everywhere. And it's like, dude, we stepped over and stepped past so many snakes and stuff. It was just like insane. Like he, right before he went in, he like looked at me and was like dead serious. Like, yo, this is serious. If we get bit, one of us gets bit, like we're the only one getting the other out. So like be ready for it kind of thing. <laughs> and I don't know if he was messing with me, but we got in there and I swear we got lost at one point for like two or three hours. 
And it's like, you get to the high point, it just looks like jungle canopy as far as you can see in every direction. And then it's like, I think he just was messing with me to add to the excitement a little. Cause as soon as we got back on the trail, it was like, seemed pretty obvious. Like that was the way to go, but, but yeah, and that's a whole nother, he has a crazy story, which, um, he told me out there that he was, you know, had just gotten let out of prison for what murder. His, what was his nickname? Oh yes, yeah, so the nickname. That's that's the Demente Ganja. Jose was his name, but Demente Ganja, which is pretty much like, you know, you've, you're stupid from smoking too much weed. Um, Great nickname. And yeah, well, you'd be walking down the street, people would be like Demente Ganja, like Pit Pasa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, he took me on a crazy adventure. That's for sure. What else about him? Well, yeah, because that was the thing with the with the. Well, first off, he had a dirt biking accident when he was a kid, and like his whole ankle was like folded. So that whole trek, he was walking on like that ball of your ankle was actually on the ground. Wow. Oh, crazy. Like catching, yep. you know? So he's walking like almost like that, um, which was crazy that he was like a hiking guide. But um, yeah, he had this crazy th- story where he was a house sitting for these people, like American people, and they all went missing. Or no, they didn't go missing. They were found dead. Okay, even worse. And he was the last documented person seeing them because he was their house sitter taking care of their house. And I don't know. I don't know how much to believe of it because it all just seems so crazy, but I just kind of gave him the benefit of the doubt. But like he had this story where, yeah, he got arrested for this because that that was the last person to contact. There was no other evidence. They just kind of like had a hunch it was him, but they like threw him in jail. And then he spent like a year in there and they like, oh, there was not enough evidence or something. They let him go. And then, so he just goes back to his life and then they're like, actually came six months later and were like, at his house, wait, we actually are taking you in. And they like apprehended him and he like freaked out, grabbed the machete and had this whole crazy story. But apparently he, he was a convicted murderer, maybe. Allegedly, we should yeah. say. For legal purposes. We're not sure about Demente. Good Kanye. guy, though. Well, he led you through uh, snake, venomous snake, <laughs> snake infested <laughs> jungles. Yes, yeah. murderous snakes, at least. Man, you've had a couple. You've had some life experiences, J. Rob. <laughs> <Few, few laughs> Holy shit, dude! <laughs> I have a feeling there's more to come. I mean, I, I, I'm. You know, we should maybe before we go, keep going on life experiences. One thing we got to note on is talking about um, A. Rob's. Uh, the the nonprofit you guys got going on yeah you want to just explain what that's all about and how people can support because it sounds really rad for sure for sure um a rob plant a seed project it was kind of um after aaron's passing uh, it was sort of something my family we all kind of decided to do to sort of keep his his legacy a little a little stronger in the area and like get more kids that didn't have exposure to the mountains and snowboarding like out there and up there, which was something Aaron was pretty passionate about and, and into doing already. So it was like kind of a perfect fit. And just the way that the mountain is set up and we had such a good relationship, it all kind of worked out pretty well. And we got the whole thing going, started pretty small, maybe like 10 kids. And now my mom's got 30 plus kids up there, her seeds, she calls them. And now there's kids who have like, you know, the program's 12 years old now. So there's kids who like started, who are now like coaches mm. And then there's like, you know, kids who did it a few years ago who are now just like around helping out still. And it's created a really cool kind of community around around it. And kind of like, you know, my mom's like Aaron and I's like biggest fans, you know. So she's she, it's really awesome for her to have this this way to kind of keep spreading Aaron's sort of stoke and, and vibe and message out there and like have fun and help kids. And, you know, she's always been connected with the mountains, too, like. She grew up skiing and kind of brought us up skiing and snowboarding. So it's like, it's such an awesome thing for her. And all, I mean, all the kids, of course, is just incredible. Awesome. Mm. And the best way to help, I mean, they do the Smash Life Bank Slalom every year. And I mean, all the proceeds of that event, shout out Shane Stalling, who'd run that forever. And I think he just turned over the reins to Kyle Miller, if I believe if I'm correct. Another Montana legend, legendary snowboarder. And, um, Man, it's such. It's been a couple of years since I've been now, but it's always such a good vibe. And mm-hmm. kids come out from Washington, from all over, you know, and build the course. And it's just like such a fun camp out, usually at Lost Trail, um, in Montana, Montana Idaho border. And it's uh, two hundred bucks to sponsor a kid. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So 200 bucks, and it's pretty cool because we sp- actually sponsored one, and my mom um, sent us the whole package and everything, and it's like they'll give you a little update on how, like, a few snaps of the kids. They'll, like, yeah. write the sponsor a letter. We'll, and... we'll just go ahead right now and sponsor uh, – we'll sponsor two kids from the bomb hole. Just oh, right so, man. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. you. Just, Thank we'll you, that, guys. We'll get her Dang. taken care of after this. Yeah, but, yeah, it sounds like a really rad – Sounds amazing, and your mom was telling me a little bit more, like, early on – Kine was a big supporter. Randy Torkum for sure. A bunch of stuff for out sure. And a bunch of brands. So. Yeah, a lot of my sponsors kind of stepped up and sent whatever kid stuff they had around, and mm-hmm. it was really, really cool. Yeah, real cool communal thing. Yeah, awesome. A Rob plant a seed project. Amazing. Yes, yes. Um, and also, your mom went to Alaska. Yeah, she's done the tailgate Alaska. Like I don't know, four or five years. It's been a few years, but yeah, like. Because Aaron, Aaron was up there at, like, the very beginning of that event um, when it was still pretty small. And I think his whole energy just, like, really took the whole the whole feel up there. It was, like, to another level. And um, so they loved him. And then, wow, when he passed away, like, she got the invite. Because he was always cooking up food, chefing up food. And he's like, yeah, my mom taught me how to, taught me everything I know in the kitchen or whatever, you know. And, like... So yeah, well, he wasn't there to go. They like hit her up and were like, "You want to come?" And she was full on like camp cook, camp mom, like put her up in an RV and the wow. whole, the whole deal. Um, sledded her. They like doubled her up way up there at one point. She's like, "I'll never do that again." But, <laughs> uh, so that was cool. cool. Legendary. All right, we just took a quick break and we were talking off air. And Mikey, you highlighted about snowboarding being one of the three soul sports that you said yeah skate snow surf and uh you know j-rob was talking earlier and i think you know you're kind of in the zone talking about snowboarding being a gateway to something bigger potentially i feel the same way yeah i don't know if you feel the same way chris 100 percent. yeah yeah the, those are my favorite types of conversations talking yeah. about this stuff yeah yeah well i think i mean honestly i'm sure a big part of that is the fact that it it happens in nature, you know, mm-hmm. um, that, so there's that alone. And then I guess the, the relationship you have with yourself and your environment that you're in and kind of learning how that all comes together. And, and I mean, so much of it is a feeling like, why do we even, why do we snowboard? Cause it feels good. And, you know, if it like a feeling, you can't really see, you can't, touch you know but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist Mm -hmm. so i think within that and just thinking in those terms it kind of like makes you a little more open-minded a little more i guess aware or open to sort of other ideas and other things that you can't see that might doesn't necessarily mean they don't exist Mm -hmm. um that makes so much sense. It but. makes so much sense. And that's, I like, I like there's, there's your kind of analytical science mind. If you can't see it and you can't prove it, it doesn't exist. Yeah. But there's kind of an open to like, well, that seemed divine mm-hmm. and just unexplainable. Mm-hmm. But it, it's, I like the gateway connection. Yeah, there. I like the gateway. And you're witnessing all this magic, being in the mountains, and and when you're riding with your friends on that level, and like seeing this stuff, and all the whole like stew of it of it all, the ingredients together, is it's magic. Mm-hmm. There's so many magical moments, and it's like even if it's some, as simple as like a bird, like on your takeoff, or like yeah. you know, whatever. Like the other day, it was like a li- like a little. Um, a little like ground squirrel, some little rodent took a little poo on the top of this little <laughs> snow thing. And I was like looking for a way to jump into this little face. And I was like, oh, he led me right there. There's the spot. You know, so it's like. Shit marks the spot. Yeah. yeah. You know, Follow the log. You're looking. <laughs> it does. Yeah. The other thing I would say, you know, I, uh, I remember back to my early days, but this year more, I'm out here with some young kids and. You're in nature, you're with rad people, and also just exerting your body to the limit. So you're exhausted, and then you push further, 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 further. And I think when you push past your body or your mind, that's the gateway. For sure, Mike. Yeah, that's that's spot on, man. That is it. You know, it's another cool thing to talk about, you know, going back to the spirituality thing. 
you know, the other day I was a while back, I was in Wyoming with, with Sage mm. and we built a jacker of a cheese wedge <laughs> and I'm a little rusty. I've been in the, I've been sitting, I sit in this chair and talk to people and the podcast I legs. Yeah, I got podcast legs. <laughs> I mean, it's still in there, but I'm just not, I just don't have as much time. I don't have as many reps. So I'm just not as sharp as I once was when all I did was snowboard and we built this yeah. jacker. And I was scared. I haven't hit a jacker in a while, you know? <laughs> scary, and we were dude. heading out to go sled, and it was cold. It was like, it was bone chilling cold snowmobile. You know, you're up first thing in the morning, yep. sun's coming up over the mountains. And I felt like a like a warrior heading out to yeah. battle. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, you're getting yourself like, you're like, I'm going to fucking, like, you're committed. You're yeah. like, I'm fuck. I know what trick I'm doing on this. That's and I'm sick. like, going to chuck. Yeah. And like, that's another thing that not all humans will experience is mm-hmm. when you're like, I'm going to get fucking rowdy today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I'm geared up. Yeah. Well, and even with, within that, as exciting as that is, and that's kind of the the like icing, like the cherry on top. Mm-hmm. But like all that's what I've learned to appreciate, especially kind of coming back into this, mm. um, being the time away. And it's like all the little things of the process mm-hmm. are so amazing, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like yeah, I mean, sometimes it could be a little frustrating, but even those little frustrating moments and stuff, and it's all like, oh, and you like l- take a step back, and you're like, dude, this is all so sick. This mm-hmm. is every little thing about it to the people, the places, the, yeah, the writing, of course, is like the smells, the nature, like the animals. It's like it really all comes together. And like, yeah, you're exerting yourself, like exercise, and it's like so you're already kind of elevated. And I think, yeah, you're, you're open and you're a little more open to things you're going to you're gonna have. It's a recipe for a good time. Really. <laughs> totally. Well said. Yeah. Well said. And, and even understanding snowboarding on a deeper fundamental level, talking about the power of suggestion, right, and being open. And it's like there's kind of a similar mentality if you're riding a line and you're on top of a face and there's a couple little features down there. Like what does it want you to do? What is the what is the mount what do the contours of the mountain want you to do? They want, want you to drop in and they want you to flow a heel side, you know, like Craig Ke- Kelly says, be the ball yeah. and follow that same and it'll guide you, you know, it'll if you if you look at, you know, Nicholas Mueller in his prime and oh, yeah. and, and Gigi mm-hmm. and stuff, like they it seems like they had a great understanding of that. Or still do probably. Yeah, like. they still they still do. Like and watching I haven't seen Nico ride lately, but the way Gigi's still riding. What yeah. about what about when you're tapping into a line? Are are you kind of are you getting into any head spaces like that? You know, I think really it just comes to about breathing up there, because you've kind of done all the stuff, you've seen it. You know, you're kind of looking at your photo, maybe double checking, but like at the end of the day, like you're really letting go when you drop in that face. Mm-hmm. It's like you're succumbing to like gravity and your own instincts to get you out of there um, or make the most of it or whatever it is. And it's like, yeah, I mean, so many of those lines, like big lines, it's very improvised. You're just going like, yeah, you're the ball. And you say, it's not like hitting a jump, like, oh, I'm going to do this trick and land over there. Cause you're like, oh, I'm going to turn here and then there and then there and then off this. So you never really, I shouldn't say never, rarely is like exactly like that. So like you're kind of having an audible your way out down and I think being in that spot and making those quick decisions, being that present um, is something super special that we're lucky to be able to tap into that with, especially like big mountain style riding is like, um, yeah, I, you know, other sports get it too. And I'm sure other even off on non-athletic things, people get that feeling, but it's like, well, with the mountains moving, you're on these lines. I think maybe the closest thing would be surfing. Totally. Big wave surfing. But even, you know, Mike could hate it on this, but skating's got concrete and rail and you're riding up and that's it's a little more controlled. You're dropping in on a mountain, the snow is moving, the wave is moving. You have yeah. to be willing to change with the environment. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're Certainly. talking about. Yeah. That's probably all connected to openness because you mm-hmm. can't control it. You can't, you know, you can, when you're dropping on top of a line, you have to be totally okay letting, like, knowing that things are probably out of your control. And Mm -hmm. and that, I think, there's a degree of being open and, for sure. And, you know, wanting to control is maybe a little bit more closed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And having an expectation, like you said, I've been on top of that line where you 
I'm in this, 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 and this. Yeah. But, you know, you got to drop that. Totally. See what comes up. Well, and the thing I thought about, too, because there are so many, when you're riding those big lines, there are so many things kind of that could go wrong out of your control. And it's probably not. But it's like it's the same thing. Drop into a sketchy handrail, and it's like mm, yeah. you have good to have point. some yeah, comfort. For sure, there's like some level of like letting go because mm -hmm. you're like you could rack your head, and yeah. like you could literally die in doing something like sure. that. And of course, if you're standing up at the top of it thinking about that, it's not going to put you in the right place to ride it. But you have to acknowledge that, and I guess you know. That's even putting you one step deeper into that mindset because you're like, this is, I'm like letting go. This could, you know, I mean, really anytime you merge on the highway, you're kind of should take that thing like, yeah. oh, I should be like content with life because it could all end here. You never know. But like, I think having that, not like dwelling on it, but that opens your mind a little bit maybe to more things too. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Really cool. It's fun talking about snowboard philosophy, and, and it's cool because a lot of, you know, humans that go to college, and they have, like, degrees where they learn things and from professors, and that's fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, uh, you know, failed everything, never done college. None, none of us really are, are formally educated, and but the mountains and snowboarding, it does they do teach you things. You do mm -hmm. learn through life experiences. Mm -hmm. and Definitely. Well, it's nice to talk about them because I think we sort of just do them. So yeah. That's what's nice about this platform. You get to explain your process, which has been fascinating. Sure. Yeah, it's funny because, yeah, I guess a lot of this stuff I didn't really put into even words or thoughts and yeah. just to kind of try and articulate it, mm -hmm. like what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. It's kind of opened in my mind a little bit to some of it even. Mm. Yeah, it's fun to see, you know, you've lived this, this unbelievable life of just experiences that are almost more bizarre than than reality like you can even, you can't even plan them mm -hmm. and and it, it's just cool to kind of see how the the philosophy of life trickles into snowboarding and how the philosophy of snowboarding trickles into life mm. and it's just fun stuff to talk about really mm -hmm. you know cool i think so <laughs> <laughs> so let's bring it back into to, to kind of where you're at with this kind of tie this whole thing together it seems like you you started you know came up snowboarding and then kind of went drift away from it you're doing your crab crab boating and your your horse packing and all this stuff and then um and i kind of want to just talk about this like reintegration back into the snowboard world from from your quick hiatus and, and where you're at with all that and how you're feeling about everything cool yeah um yeah i'm excited to talk about that for sure because um it is so fresh and new and it's kind of like what i'm in right now going through right now um so yeah it's it's a good good feeling and i feel like after you know kind of doing that fishing thing and then i actually like tried my own seafood business and like kind of really dove into that world and you know with the fishing was actually making decent money but something was missing because for me when it was it's like snowboarding was a job yeah however i was never money motivated it was clip motivated or part motivated or like progression motivated snowboard motivated i wasn't like i'm gonna do this so i can make money more money whatever it was like i want to do this because i want to do this like whether the money comes or not i'm gonna do it for now and then it did come and i was able to yeah progress into these apps and films and all these spectacular experiences and uh but yeah it never really felt like a job and then when it was like now it's time to go to your job when I was working on the fishing boat and it's like I didn't have no real I didn't grow up fishing I don't have like not a boat guy it was just like an exciting new op job opportunity and I needed money and not even necessarily like I don't necessarily even feel good about catching so many fish and so much stuff out of the ocean. So like it more, it like didn't really align with my values and definitely not my, like no disrespect to the, to the, any of the fishermen. Like it is, there are a lot of really amazing people and it is, there's some really cool things about the industry. Um, for me, it, it wasn't like I grew up in that family and wanted to do that. I was like, I wanted to be a snowboarder and now here I am on a fishing boat. And it was like, 
yeah, I started making money and was still like start snowboarding on my side on the, you know, sidelines or whatever spare time. But it was like, as soon as it shifted from the reason you get up, the reason you go to work is to get the paycheck. That didn't, that, that was starting to kind of wear on me, I think. And it was like, and I'm, I feel so blessed that I've been able to make it through so much of my life or I've made it through so much of my life without that sort of daunting job that you don't want to go to. Um, but you have to, have to, to pay the bills or whatever. Um, so that was like an eye opener when it was like, well, God, I, I got into this to make money. Now I had some money and it was like, I'm not, I was way happier just like spending all my money on heli and just like being broke all summer and figuring it out. Like that was way better. Um, cause I was doing what I wanted, like who cared about the money. And then, um, yeah, so that was kind of an eye opener was like, this can't, you know, if I have the opportunity and if I'm possible or like my body and mind can still like get in that space to snowboard at this level, like I'm, I want to do it. And so that did happen like a couple winters ago. I like really made the push and that's when I met Donald, my Bothell chiropractic clinic and he like helped me go on a fund a couple trips went out to jackson did the corbett's coolar like did a first descent through some crack that, that no cool. snowboarder no one had ever gone down it was like a new way into corbett's which i thought was cool and like elias he kind of like brought me into that and we rode out there together elias elhard and so he's kind of like those guys kind of like help sort of pull me back in a little mm. Um, I'm like, dude, you got this. Like, mm -hmm. let's let's make it happen. And then, so yeah, with that support from Donald, I did those couple trips, and felt like I was kind of getting a little little mode, little like steam going. But then I was still like trying to do this seafood thing. So like, I was distracted from the snowboarding. And like, I got home and like jumped into planning my business for the summer. I didn't really like finish the season off strong, but I was like pretty fired up for that next year. And then I had this. That's why I had this knee injury finally caught up with me, um, which just forced me to like slow down, pull the brakes and like fully rebuild from the bottom up. Like literally the foundation of my leg, I couldn't stand on it, you know, um, after the surgery and everything. And so with that sort of getting broke down that way, it was a, a ability to build myself back up sort of in the image that I wanted, I don't mean image like 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 an image from outside, but like my build myself up the way I wanted to be built up, you know. And so, cause yeah, it was like I'd never really been hurt, and I got this surgery, and it was like couldn't walk for six weeks, and it was this crazy thing, you know. And like, but it took me to like took a lot of steps like in the positive positive direction, you know, um, through that, and like kind of came out the other side, like super fired up. Um, Cause man, being like when you can't even walk and this was a pretty minor injury compared to so many other snowboarders experiences with injuries. So I feel kind of silly even making it like a big thing. Cause it's a small injury, but small surgery, but it was like, for me, it was pretty intense. And I had really doubted if I'd ever be able to, or ever want to, or if I'd be for afraid to snowboard hard and like, so when I just went, put all that, um, like all of that sort of unknown, like that kind of anxiety of like, is, will I ever do this again? Into the rehab and the eating well and sleeping and cutting out the nicotine and doing all these things to give my knee like the best chance possible. Um, and man, I don't know, it feels like it healed up so well. And then like through that, that like when, you, when you're consciously taking care of yourself and build bettering yourself, it kind of builds momentum, you know? So it was started with the, with the working out. And then it was like the diet. I mean, I cut the tobacco out cause it helps heal. The cartilage will heal faster. And then it's like the diet and the, or the exercise. And then I was like focusing on the diet and I was like trying to sleep nine, 10 hours a night to like let this thing heal and just being super smart about it. And the other things kind of built after that, like the more, like my mental health started getting better. And then kind of tapped into this more kind of spiritual healing side and like 
with Donald and, and the sweats and everything. And then it was just like kind of it all kind of was coming to head with this this winter. It was like boom. It was a no brainer that I was like gonna um jump into like into snowboarding. Like I kind of lucked out. My buddy Greg again, the my transition coach, invited me like last minute. One of his crew got sick. So we ended up fishing Puget Sound, like caught quite a few salmon, got a decent chunk of cash. And I was like, well, that's enough to at least get me, you know, a couple months into the season. We'll see what I can kind of build up from there. And then, dude, so much like, you know, and then like my first trip out here, Bjorn was like, approached me, wanted me to ride, sign me on Cardiff snowboards, which was like a huge honor. Like one of my childhood heroes, like handpicking me as like one of his favorite riders out there. And to be able, the ability to work with him and Neil Provo on stuff like that is like Incredible. such a cool opportunity. I could not pass it up really. And then, you know, now it's just always, it's been working up. Soon as I was like, but snowboarding is the focus and the motivation and not the money. It all just worked out. I'd be like run out of money, but like someone would send me, a, you know, an expense thing would come out or like I'd sell a snowboard and it was just like, keep keep me going until we're now it's like signing a contract and then like signing another contract. Like, and it's like, cool, dude, like this is so sick. I put yourself out there and then have it received so well. Um, it feels really good. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm like, I'm proud of myself for it. Cause it isn't an easy step at 38 to be like, I'm it's of course, when you're 18, you're like, I got this, I'm doing it. I'm going to be a pro snowboarder. When you're 38 and you're like trying to become a pro again, it's like a different. Granted, like I've already have this, you know, history that's like, I'm realizing how much an impact that it has had, and is like that's why, you know, boom, like that thing with because I, I talked to Bodie was just kind of getting some like kind of career pointers, and that's when he was like, that's how this whole TGR thing came. And he's like, well, dude, Mike Hatchett just started making a movie like last week. He started filming. And if you've got footage already, like, I'm sure you'd be stoked. He's, like, looking for footage right now. Um, I was like, dude, thanks. So I just text. I still had Hatch's number from when I was in Tahoe, living in Tahoe, texted him and was like, hey, I heard you might be looking for footy. And he's like, yeah, man, I'll call you later today or whatever. And he <laughs> calls and he's like, so you want to film for the movie? I'm like, heck, yeah. Like, this is sick, you know? And he's like, and I'm like, you know, but and he's I'm like you know I don't have a ton of sponsor support. And he's like oh it's like we'll f we'll figure it out. That stuff will come. I want you in this movie if you want to be in this movie. And having like someone like Hatchet recognize who I've looked up to what he's done so much over the years, and to like see an opportunity with me to like and wanting to work with me was like at whatever cost, even if I don't have a huge 30k sponsor buy-in or something like everyone else, like whatever it was. It was just like another like a little more gas on the fire, dude. And then like that first week out in Washington, I was like, dude, I'm filming for Mike Hatchett's movie, TGR films, you know? And we had a sick week out there with Sam and the homie Xander and then came out here and like Bodie has been such a huge help. Like I'm I feel bad because it's almost like he's kind of having to like babysit me a little. Cause I didn't have any like I didn't have the sled, like Ted Borland freaking rent me a sled let me borrow a sled whatever you want to call it huge shout out to ted dude because like my season i wouldn't even be out there with those guys if ted mm -hmm. wasn't the homie and literally wanting to help mm -hmm. me reach my goals and dreams you know um and yeah and then just the whole crew it's been like such a sick it's kind of just felt like i just kind of didn't really miss a beat you know and i'm out there with like Bodie is a beast right like he's hitting these cr huge, like the first thing we built was like a jump taller than the ceiling. <laughs> and it was like, what do you do on this thing? And it was like, I didn't actually land anything, but I like hung, you know, in the session. Like we both did like the scorpions of the season. So, <laughs> but like, it's just felt so good. Like, um, just hopping in, like, it's like it never really stopped. You know, I kind of picking up where I left off. Like for so long, I felt that like my best snowboarding was behind me because there's no way I'm going to top that. But it's not even really about that. Like what's gnarly or anything. It's like I can progress my riding in so many different ways. And it's mm -hmm. like I still have so many ideas. And now I'm grateful. Cause like, dude, if I had to film the part every year, the last eight years, 
dude, what? Like, I'd be out of ideas. You know what I mean? Like, out of spots, out of ideas. And I was just like, kind of like a reset. Everything's new. Everything's fresh. It's almost a decade later. Mm -hmm. I'm like, as stoked, just as stoked as I was pretty much. But like, a new, whole new perspective on it. We're we're uh, we're lucky to have you in snowboard, J Rob. We are lucky. Thanks, to have Chris. You. And uh, I will say, you know, it's interesting to hear your perspective because you know, seeing you at Pow Mau, whenever that was a few months ago, like nothing changed in my mind. You know, it's like I'm like, oh, fucking J Rob's here. Last time I probably saw him was like World Quarter or Bodie Merrill's contest, like yeah, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, you totally know, like so and you're ago. like, but it's like nothing changed in our heads. Like we're. I mean, this is J J Rob saying J Rob is back radio seven in a birthday bowl. It's fucking J, you know. But yeah. but you've gone through all these wild life experiences. But snowboarding is always like we've always held the space for you. I think you know. Not mm-hmm. that I'm speaking for for snowboarding collectively. Wow, we got the animals in the lobby the holding animals. up Phil the dog. Well, the other thing I would mention is during that last segment, talking about coming back to this very ground zero spot, healing your knee. Yeah. And then Good you point. just explained where you're at now, the progression. The energy in the room went from a two to like a ten. Like it's I can feel it. Mm. The passion is a hundred percent there. And I can't wait to see what comes out because I feel like you could do this for as long as you want. Mikey's Thanks, fifty. Man. Yeah, Mikey's watching 50, you is like okay, okay, I got some, some of his best shit. shit. I got he some the gas biggest in the cliff tank. at yeah. Brighton this okay. year. Has been hit so by Mikey, sick. and he's fifty years old. Well, the that's end, an inspiration, the bro. passion, though, the energy. Yeah. It's like that's what it's about, and being around people. Your Bodie, I was with, you know, Boggs and Blake, and countless Spencer. Totally, and that's like having the family and Elias and all these people calling you back, whispering yeah. like, "You do this," and I'm so stoked to see you. Just so happy and stoked and back. Sick. Yeah. Thanks. Me yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, it feels good, and yeah. it's like. A little more like a balanced, wholesome mm-hmm. lifestyle mm-hmm. in a way to that's kind of allowing me, I think, to put this time and energy mm-hmm. into snowboarding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love it. Another kind of underarching thing, just kind of wanted to point out too, is you have your knee injury, which you know seems like the worst thing ever, but you know, the way you explain that was kind of the biggest like blessing ever, or however you want to put that, uh, you know, gift or. You know, it it, it 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 attributed that that breakdown to to rebuild, and and I think that's like a cool thing to highlight on on, on a per, as far as perspective goes, right? Like, it's yeah, like, it seems like the worst thing ever, but it turned out to be maybe one of the better things that happened. Yeah, it helped me learn a lot. Like, and about like my athleticism, I think I'd kind of disconnected from that a little. Mm-hmm. Um, but like doing the rehab and building up and like how intense some of the, I was getting with those workouts and how serious I was taking. It was like, mm-hmm. it was like training, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was like, what am I training for? I'm not even a, like really a, wasn't even in sponsored, didn't even have much going on in snowboarding, but I was like still training. Like I was mm-hmm. going back for the Olympics or something, you know, mm-hmm. it's like the energy I put into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you get what you, what you put in, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And the focus that takes, to get back to for whatever reason the focus it takes to really come back like that and then you plug in all your knowledge of all your snowboard history and time spent on the mountain like you could come back better yeah stronger yeah and i do feel i feel like like the eyes the eyes kind of grown and developed a little more mm-hmm. and like yeah i think that they're you know you can get that heli budge so i can you know get up and really Hell yeah. really uh <laughs> So if anyone listening, you know, <laughs> so step up. Uh, you'll have plenty. But, um, right but yeah, I'm so happy and content with just hiking and riding cool mm-hmm. stuff too. Like, I yeah. love that. Like, that's really, honestly, I prefer that pace. It's like sustainable. Mm-hmm. We also, you know, we've seen a couple of leaks of some of your clips and you're taking, a, it seems like a bit of a crafty, thoughtful approach to your tricks, like kind of progressive, not in size, but in, in like thought you know uh what's where's your headspace at with logging clips do you have a direction do you have a vision do you have intent well i mean i love the natural terrains and the powder of course so like anytime i can hit something ride natural lines and or even airs in powder like that's where my head's at um and but it's been cool like with going out with the crew with Bodie and stuff and we're just like like we did a a quite a bit of that 
type of writing and got some really cool stuff. But, you know, the conditions don't always line up for that type of writing either, you know? So, like, we've been getting more creative, like, building little stuff or hitting something natural. Like, just the last couple of days, just, just Shane and I hiking off of Brighton. And, I mean, those are some of my favorite clips of the trip, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, just little stuff that people might not even look at as, like, a clip. There's, like, a huge jump spot here, and then there's, like, a little cornice here that, you know, isn't as obvious or, or – but mm. – yeah, if you're kind of looking. I mean, I always just love the, the kind of playful stuff and always love weird tricks and flips. So, like, to be able to have the big mountain kind of edging and speed control and riding, that kind of riding and being pretty freestyle motivated, it's, it's like, a pretty fun way to snowboard. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know if I'd rather – not like, in this – hope this doesn't come out as, like, cocky, arrogant, but I don't know if I'd even rather snowboard through anyone else's lens – than my own. Mm-hmm. Like, of course, I admire other riders and look up to them. But I think, like, I'm really content with my how I see things snowboarding and how I can ride the terrain. Like, of course, I want to keep improving, but, like, I'm pretty happy to be me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's cool to say that because, you know, that. you're not I always – that. That's an, it's not always easy to say, but – I don't think a lot, of, a lot of people might not be, be even able to say that. No, no. There's a lot of – Very nice. A lot of times self-hatred is the motivator, <laughs> honestly. Uh-huh. So that's and I've a, been that's there. A, it's coming yeah. from a healthy yeah. – I've been there, you know, too. A lot of the greats are fueled by self-hate. And, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, like if you can snowboard but do it from a healthy space, mm-hmm. god damn, that's beautiful because mm-hmm. it's hard to be – it's, you know, because you're just okay. You know, you're good – no matter what happens, you don't, it's not life or death. Like, it's not like your self-worth is riding on you landing this trick or not. Totally. Yeah. Which is really special. Mm-hmm. And I also kind of want to highlight too, you know, I think thinking about the fundamentals of the clips I've seen, it's cool cool to see your foundation of your snowboarding because, you know, if you look at coming up through Think Tank and that, you know, being kind of by osmosis, a lot of my friends being in Think Tank, like it, I've developed and seen people who are in it develop like this crazy open-mindedness towards trick selection that's like the crafty stuff it, smaller stuff is okay whereas maybe a trick snob i go film for video grass or other videos you know we're gonna get into a little bit more trick snob elitist shit right where it's like uh the spot's got to be good the trick's got to be good totally, it's a little totally. it's a little more which you know i love them both more limitations more limitations yeah oh, so less yeah. yeah concern over creativity clogs uh, cr- concern over criticism clogs creativity was one of their ads, which is really good. So it's kind of an open mindedness approach. So you take your blend of think think, which is open minded snowboarding mixed with big mountain attacking Manuel Diaz type of shit, and you got a beautiful blend that's J Rob that can go do a, a cork seven off a of pole jam, and it's fucking cool. <laughs> Thanks. You know, where a snob, a snowboard snob, wouldn't hit a spot like that probably. We're getting deep into the like psychology yeah. of um, I love it upper echelon. I think and I did kind of get snobby, <laughs> but I was snobby for a minute. Like oh, I'm only gonna ride if it's gnar like some sick gnarly thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that was part of the kind of demise. It was like t- too much t- limiting yourself. Like you can only do it if it's like big or gnarly or fast or whatever. And it's like well, that's not how I came up, and that's not even how I like to ride all the time. Mm-hmm. So. Now coming back and it's like everything, yeah. Like I said, everything's fresh and everything's everything's a hit. Great Don't. perspective. Well, we're gonna get into hot takes. We do this every episode. Uh, hot takes is presented by Oakley. Uh, I recently started running a helmet. I run the Oakley Mod One Pro. The thing kicks ass. It's got a little uh, boa on the back. I usually run a little ear flap beanie underneath, beanie underneath, goggles over, and then I run the Oakley Line Miner Pros. Uh, they got a bunch of incredible colorways and they support the show. So uh, if you want a dope helmet goggle setup, I'd go Oakley Mod 1 Pro with the Oakley Line Miners. You just can't go wrong. You look like a kind of look like a golden god out there, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to start it off with uh, the, the GOAT, greatest of all time. Or, you know, at the time when we came up with this, uh, The Last Dance was very popular, which is uh, the Michael Jordan documentary. So... The MJ of snowboarding, you know, like uh, who, who's your who's your kind of uh, North Star, both male and female, of the greats in snowboarding? So I'll start with male for now. Well, ladies first. Ladies first. Um, goat, the ladies, I think it just so much of 
It's like not just obviously her snowboarding and everything she did with that, the winds, the segments, but um, also like how she's navigated post pro so well. Um, and that would that would be Barrett Christie. Mm, great answer. And like so that she's like, yes, yeah, such a hero in that in that regard, and like the family that they're raising is incredible and their whole vibe is spot on. Um, but yeah, so on the male side, I'm going with A-Rob. Amazing. Woo! The little bro. Cause it's like the reality is like the greatest of all time. It's like who inspired you the most, mm -hmm. who gives you the most inspiration. And like, for me, that's him. And like, his just the way he rode the mountain, he wasn't the craziest with tricks and, and stuff, but like he did stuff with intention and he rode the mountain like just like exactly how it was supposed to be. And like watching him, I'd never watched Terry a or Craig in person ride Tahoe lines, but watching Aaron do that in person, it, it, it might, it's like it could have been either one of those guys as far as like the level and the fact that that is my little brother. And like, I got to share so much of that with him is like, it kind of makes it, it's a, cause I thought about this a lot, but it was like, yeah, it comes back to him for sure. So dope. Okay. To you is snowboarding an art form or a sport? Art, art or sport. Well, it, it, it depends on, yeah, I guess you're, you're in how, how you're doing it, I guess it technically, even in the contest scene, there's some art, artistic creativity involved. So I'll, I'll stick with art because, yeah, it ain't, it's not a sport, a real sport. Who's the most Better. underrated? Ooh, underrated. Ooh, this was, this is a tough one, but I think it kind of got a sort of two part answer almost, maybe. But it's like, I think this guy, he pretty, he just embodies. Like the snowboard, not just the style on the board, but the like technical skill. He's got the tricks, like the lifestyle and the whole vibe is just out of this world. So sick. And I'm saying Blair Habenich. Whoo! Oh. He's got, I, I mean, he is like a Northwest icon to me. And I think so many others. And I don't know the details on his sponsors deal, but it's like, I feel like he should be getting should be on like whatever brand he wanted to be on kind of deal that's kind of how i see him and like in the water on the skate park like the whole life like on the snow is insane awesome this parts he's filmed they're so good still doing it too great answer okay i wonder what your answer is gonna be on this next one it's kind of a hard-hitting one steel or powder well dude i what i really want to do some spots like the Lewif, the kind of style lewif has been riding, yeah, yeah. where he's doing steel and powder, like that. That is appealing, and of course, I, I mean, I love the steel, but it's like powder is kind of my, you know, if I could do a little kind of mix a little steel in there, it'd be all right. But so you, you, you got I'm a powder, be, okay, I'm a powder, powder guy. Powder dude. What can I say? We, yep. Best style, in your opinion, best style. Ooh, best style. And this too, it's like, I think there's another level of riding with someone than seeing the parts because mm -hmm. that's incredible too. But when you see the person do it and you see their parts, so like style, I mean, it's about as hard charge, full pull as you can as Manuel Diaz, dude. Mm -hmm. awesome. Like the homie. I mean, I got to give it to him. And that, well, can I do a can I do a street guy too? Sure. Because I'm giving that one to Ozzy Henning. Woo! For Great sure. Great like, answer. It's kind of, I mean, yeah, it's just so good, dude. I can't even put, put it into words, but. Yeah, he just yeah, looks, he looks right on a board. They both do. Uh, okay, then you got um, best method, in your opinion. <sighs> Dang, that's tough, dude. Yeah. Oh, I'm looking at one. Just, I'm going Jamie. Final answer. Yeah. <laughs> just envisioning all those different methods go by. Yeah, I know. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> seeing a Jamie one right now, so that's helping. But it'd be between, <laughs> like, Jamie, Terrier, 
Nico and maybe Jake, but I'm going to Jamie. So. And you're living in the Northwest right now, so yeah, you don't want to get, yeah, like, beat get up kicked out of, <laughs> kicked out of Washington. Yeah, yeah that's important. It's an important factor. Um, to you, like... You know, what is, I think this is a better way. Like, you, I could ask you, what's your favorite video ever made? Or, like, maybe what's the most impactful video on you that's ever been made? So, for me, and I like, I remember seeing it, and that was part of, I guess, us not having a park. And I was like, always looking for those kind of natural hits. And then when Hawken Factor came out, and it's like that segment, they're in like New Zealand or mm -hmm. something, and yeah. it's just like a powder. It looks like a snowboard park, but it's like a big powdery mountain. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching that, and that was just like light went off in my head of like, that's Mickey Albin, mm -hmm. freaking Iker Hernandez, Mickey, that section, Terrier. Nice. Like, dude, Mickey, that he, like, he'd be up there with my style, one of my style gods too, I think, mm -hmm. like his whole style. Um, but yeah, watching, yeah, that, I think that's the most, the biggest one. And like looking at my writing now, I think it's, had the most sort of impact even more so than like a lot of the more freestyle videos even though i was like obsessed with a lot of that too okay uh in terms of board graphics what's the best graphic ever in your opinion who you know since since i left him on the style out of the style club um i'll say mickey albin's the the gons burton ghost one so we've never gotten that one and That's it's dope. a great answer you have gotten that one no, no one's no one said that one because a lot of oh, people, dang. we get like you know a lot of people default to Turier sword, um, but that's the most common one. But uh, I like that graphic. It's heck yeah, it's a good kind of curveball. But okay, uh, simple. Yeah, Very good. And then let's see what else we got. Uh, pants over or under the high back? How do you set up your board? I strap in under. Under yeah. like behind or yeah, high backs over the kind of OG. It's kind of rare to see over high back these days. All right, you could go heli board in three people, you know, that doesn't matter who, uh, figuratively, uh, mm -hmm. celebrities, and you're just going good times. You're maybe not going to like, you're just going to have the best day of your life. So we'll go like a little beyond the grave for a couple, for at least one of them because we got to bring the bro. And then I'll say my youngest brother, Sean, also. Dope. Um, He's just such a homie, dude. Um, he's a ripper, too. He never did, like, the pro thing or sponsor thing too hard, but sick ripper. And, um, heck, you know, I'd love to take my lady heli skiing. You know, I don't know if it, that'd be probably more of, like, a like a date kind of thing, just the two of us. So, yeah, we'll bring her in. We'll bring her along. Mm, great answer. Awesome. So, Sierra, yeah, love you, dude. Go to first try like backcountry step down trick like need to land. What are you gonna do? It's like gun to your head, land this front three. Boom. Okay. Um, last question. Worst trend. What do you got? Arguing is that a trend? Can sure. Be. Yeah. Like kind of the or like negativity. Mm -hmm. How about let's just leave it with that because yeah. that's that spans so much of. Things would fall under that. Mm -hmm. Really, anything worth hating on and just negativity is probably mm. it's a great awesome. answer. Love that. Okay, um, we're moving right along here, and I think we should get into the pub beer crapshoot. So we're going to talk pub beer for a second. Hang tight. Welcome to the pub beer crapshoot. Pub beer is a supporter of the show. They support many snowboarders. Uh and, uh, yeah, if you're thinking about cracking some cold ones after a nice day of snowboarding, what are you going to choose, Mike? Pub beer. Absolutely. You can drink one. You can drink 50. Whatever you do, do it responsibly. Now, go ahead and roll that. Uh, roll those two dice, and we'll tell you what you got to do. Takes me back. We used to cut the <laughs> CeeLo, CeeLo kids in high school. Well, the Goon Gear is a six. So you, oh, you I got, got a four. Got a four. Four? Oh, this is a fun one. Uh, describe one of your worst bails of your career. Oh, God. Um, one that stands out, maybe. Dude, was it yesterday? <laughs> Two days ago? <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it's definitely the most fresh. Um, Don't tear it. That sounds good. It was kind of the same move. Actually, two, my two worst bails are kind of the same motion. I just land 
on my back with my feet like above my head in a full taco. Mm-hmm. Um, one happened when I was 17 or 18 in Bend, Oregon. The Cascade Bank Rails, this tight kink, caught this kink, laid back. Back just taco. Back taco down on the landing. And then just the other day, dude, I did a back taco, <laughs> which made the craziest noise. I thought it was my <laughs> spine yeah, or something crunching. <laughs> But, like, I think it was just the way my jacket and helmet hit the kind of – wasn't, like, powder. is kind of hot pow. Mm-hmm. But, dude, I go off this – like, do, like, a melon hand drag off this cornice. Mm-hmm. And I did it a couple times already. I was just trying to get it a little better. But I – so I, I take a little different angle, and apparently the cornice doesn't extend as far that way, and I, like, don't even hit the cornice. So I just, like, go to hand plant and, like, come back. Uh, half but back I just up. go – who I do, like, a front flip. Half a front flip going backwards, though. So I like my feet came around the other way, but I landed in full crunch. Um, yeah, that's one. Free- I've been pretty lucky, dude. Like with injuries and bails, like um, yeah. Thank you for doing that. most of my like my worst injuries had weren't snowboarding, which is kind of incre- incredible that um, given all the. Wild, wild times. Well, you got to slap some respect on a good back taco. That's have you ever done a Chaco taco? Uh, I, I actually have. <laughs> uh, it's a delicious treat. They have them over at Maverick. We Love walk them. over. They go Twix bar, Chaco taco. Well, I had a different summer. kind of Chaco taco, but we'll leave it there. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> you know, I originally I thought it was called a Choco taco for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, a little fun fact. Okay, so we're going to get into uh, setups. Let's get you, let's pick your brain on. Uh, your board, what you're riding, and uh, walk us through it, how you set it up. All righty. Um, right now I'm riding the 158 uh, Cardiff Crane, and it's sort of mostly a camber kind of board. It's got a little lift in the nose, but it rides pretty camber. Um, good flex, medium to stiff for flex, and uh, super nimble light board. Really been digging it. Um, and then as far as, like, my, st- like, setup, stance and everything, I'm rocking Karakorum bindings. Um, those are, like, good homies that got me on the program and kind of, like, full on with those dudes. They got the split bindings that are incredible, and now they're making, kind of developing some new new uh, solid bindings, too, that I'm excited to kind of help help work on them, kind of to develop in this new binding, um, new solid binding. Cause, yeah, they're just right down the street from my – kind of home mountain out in Washington, out Alpental there. So, um, and yeah, like as far as stance, I go sort of like 21, 21 and a half um, inches, 21 about on the front and posi six on the back. Um, normally back at least like a couple inches, two, three inches back on the board. And I think this is worth noting about the stance because when, when Aaron died, I rode down, went down to Chile. I rode his board, and I took that stance, his setup, forward lean, maxed out forward lean and all, and just put it on mine. And like this, I used to have such a wider, more freestyle duck stance, no forward lean. And when he passed away, like it was my tribute, as like a tribute to him. Like the the more I could emulate his style, the better in my opinion. So I literally just put my stance at his stance and I've pretty much been rocking it that way since like a couple minor adjustments here and there, but rad. Yeah. That is rad. So, so I'm really literally like standing in his, uh, so how he would stand you a little, still you still know? keep your four lean cranked all that? Okay. Oh yeah. So Unless that. I'm doing, if I'm doing, if I'm like, Oh, we're going to go hit a kicker today for sure. I'll like maybe bump it down a little yeah. or, a um, or a rail, especially I'll never forget hopping on a switch creeper on my board from not setting it up any different double posy full <laughs> forward lean switch 50 down a creeper and i was like looking up the rail <laughs> you know i was like okay this got this doesn't work so mm-hmm. but like if i'm free riding the mountain like definitely like i'll go max forward lean max like angles angle the back foot pretty good sick that helps keep the knees bent too which is good yeah. uh and then yeah plug the other sponsors who you, who you got supporting you right now so big shout out, um, ProTech. That's like they've been with me for what five years now. RP at ProTech. Um, yeah, just signed up with Cardiff. Been on on their ambassador program. 
thanks to Bjorn and Neil over there. And then, so I got, um, I've been rocking Air Blaster. Like, love their gear, love their whole vibe. The people over there, Jesse, Ricky, like the whole crew is super sick. So I'm really glad that I've kind of aligned with them. Let's do Aaron, kind of Aaron Road, like Ninja Suit and some Air stuff, Air Blaster goggles and stuff. So it's sick to be in that that mix. Um, those are like the main, main kind of stuff. Like, obviously... Donald with Bothell Chiropractic Clinic, he helps me out a lot um, on and off the snow, you know, in so many ways. And uh, and I've been rocking Salmon Arms with the mitts. I got the dope Salmon Arms collab and loving those mitts this winter. And um, one ball kind of with the wax and the packs and stuff. And awesome. Yeah, that's killer. That's it. One thing I was wondering, uh, I've seen a lot of people running the Air Blaster one pieces. The one piece yeah. looks. Have you been? Were you running that? Yeah, I had the. That thing seems like I the had shit the, for a powder day. Um, be, they call it the B suits, like their their three layer kind of Gore Tex one. Yeah. And I got the Yeti flage, so it like you, it's crazy. You like screen grab a f- shot or something. In the it's like where's Waldo, dude? You're like in the tree, and you can't even see. You know, it's pretty cool. Filmers probably love that. Yeah, I haven't filmed with it. That's just been my like free ride. I know. That's kidding. yeah. They they would Andy Wright would Andy Wright with would that just he just leave. Tear you apart. He'd literally leave. He wouldn't even totally. take a picture. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. Um. All right. And then um. Thank yous. Do you want to throw out thank yous? Ooh. Well, the big one. Um. Got to thank my mom. Like. All of this, you know, this is kind of she set us on for this lifestyle like pretty young, I think, and was super supportive on that. Um, so big time, the mom pops, of course, you know, kind of instilling that love for nature as a kid is pretty priceless, especially this day and age with that being kind of harder to come by. But yeah, I mean, um, my partner Sierra. Our daughter Opal, thank you, girls. Um, you make like my whole life complete with this, like our dog Stormy, you three and snowboarding, and this whole crew and community is like, you know, a few waves here and there. I think that's about all I need in life. Um, but yeah, all the sponsors, thank you guys. Um, everyone who's yeah stepped up to kind of like saw I was serious about jumping back into snowboarding and whether yeah you're supporting me by sponsoring me or you're just hyping me up and you're stoked that I'm doing it like thank to all of you um yeah and thanks to you guys for like having me here um but yeah I'll keep it there but stoked yeah thanks fuck yeah man j rob it's been a banter Banter marathon, man. It's been a what a special conversation. I feel like, man, this is a one of the more special podcasts we've ever done, man. Holy thanks, smokes. bro. Wow. Thank you. Really, thank you for sharing your story and and like so many good life lessons and takeaways and and just you've you've uh, what do they say with the the dirt bike uh, ridden hard and put away wet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you like go. That. There you <laughs> go. Like, yeah, you know he's been got a new that. lease on life. Yeah, he's but, fresh. Yeah, 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 and then you, but then you've also like Rebuilt. you're you're like I like what you just said about being a simple man. Yeah. You're just like, dude, all I need is some waves, my lady, my family, and some snowboarding. And it's like that's like the wise. That's about as wise as it gets. You know, oh, it so. took took a while to realize that. You know, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Well, I'm a slow learner. It's been an honor to be here and inspired to chat with you and you. It's Thanks, Chris. Mike. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Chris. It means a lot having me on here and. You know, if this inspires even one person to do one thing that they were afraid to do otherwise or were held back from doing otherwise, then it's I'm just ecstatic on that. So thanks, boys. We'll we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you to all our listeners, Patreon members, everybody that supports us, our sponsors. Uh, You guys rule. And once again, thank you so much for coming on. J-Rob, over and out from the bomb hole. What a banger. Yeah, boys.